Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hola, bienvenidos a tu clase de español. Soy Brenda Romagnello, tu profesora. Hello, welcome to your Spanish class. My name is Brenda Romagnello. Today we're going to have a look at the possessive adjectives in Spanish and then the different meanings of su and sus. We use the possessive adjectives in Spanish and for that we say los adjetivos posesivos to establish belonging in Spanish. Yes, to establish ownership or belonging or in certain cases, for example, when you talk about your family or your friends, we use it to establish relationships. Yes, for example, my mother, your father, etc. Let's have a look at the possessive adjectives in Spanish. So, to say my in Spanish, we are going to say the singular is mi, mi, and the plural form is mis, mis, mi, mis. To say your informal, so remember we're going to have two different yous in Spanish. You informal, which is an informal register with tú, and then a formal register with usted, yes, that we use for uh, formal situations. So your, the possessive adjective for tú would be your, and we say in Spanish singular tú and plural tus. Don't worry, we're going to talk about this difference, why do we have a singular and plural in a minute. So going back to the possessive adjectives, we're going to say tú for singular and tus for plural. Then we're going to have your for the formal register, which is the same as to say his and her. His and her, your formal will be singular su and plural sus. Su, sus. Our in Spanish is going to be the singular, we're going to have the masculino nuestro and the femenino nuestra. Nuestro, nuestra. And the plural form is going to be nuestros, nuestras. Nuestros, nuestras. Then for you all in Spain, which is vosotros, remember that we have you all in Spain, we say vosotros, and if we want to use the possessive adjective for vosotros, your, we would say the femenino singular vuestra and the masculino singular vuestro. Vuestro, vuestra. And the plural form is going to be vuestros, vuestras. Vuestros, vuestras. And then remember that we're going to have you all in Latin America is ustedes. If we want to say and talk about the possessive adjective for ustedes in Latin America, we're going to say your. And also uh, we are going to use the same possessive adjective for their, their, either femenino and masculino. And we're going to say the singular is su and the plural sus. Su and sus. As you can see here, we have different different people sharing the same possessive adjective, specifically, particularly with su and sus. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But something extremely important to point out about uh, possessive adjectives in Spanish is that what we are matching, why do we have so many different forms? So for, for vosotros, nosotros, you can see that we have four different possessive adjectives for these specific subjects. And the reason is because we're not possessing uh, we're not matching the, the subject, the person, rather we are matching what we are possessing. Yeah, so we are matching in number and also in gender what we are possessing or the relationship that we want to establish and not the person speaking. Let's have a look at some examples so you can see exactly what I mean. So remember, we match the possessive adjective in gender and number with what we possess instead of the person speaking. So we're going to say Nuestra familia es grande. Nuestra familia es grande. As you can see here, familia is femenino singular and we want to say our family. So it doesn't matter if we are saying nosotros, which is the masculino, 
we have to say nuestra familia because familia what we are owning or the relationship that we want to talk about familia is singular and femenino can you see that here that's why we have to say nuestra familia it's incorrect incorrecto to say nuestro familia okay why because familia is what we are possessing in this case so we have to say nuestra familia es grande let's have a look at another example nuestras hijas son inteligentes nuestras hijas son inteligentes our daughters are intelligent or smart as you can see in this case what we are possessing or what we're talking about is hijas which is in the plural femenino form that's why we have to say nuestras the next example we have nuestro hijo tiene cinco años nuestro hijo tiene cinco años our son is five years old as you can see now we're talking about hijo and we are still saying our but we have to say nuestro because hijo is masculino and singular and in the last example we have nuestros hijos son inteligentes remember that in spanish whenever we have the masculino plural is usually for both not only for masculino yes if you have all sons and in plural but it also is the general way that we talk about a noun in spanish so hijos in this case could also mean children or kids so it could be mixed genders in this case if you have two daughters and two sons they are your hijos no your your children in spanish we use the masculino plural also for general but we are going to say nuestros hijos son inteligentes nuestros hijos because we are here matching hijos which is in the plural and is also masculino as you can see here as a consequence we're gonna have four different ways to say our in spanish can you tell me what they are to say how do we say our in spanish we have four different <laughs> there we go four different forms yes we're gonna have nuestro nuestra nuestros nuestras and remember that will depend how we use them will depend on what we're talking about what we are possessing now let's talk about tú i don't know if you have noticed but we have tú with uh, the tilde yes with the written accent and tú without the tilde without that written accent and what is the difference between these two as you can see tú with the little written accent means you yes so that is the subject that is a person that is a personal pronoun the second personal personal pronoun that we have in spanish which means you and tú is informal register so we use it in, in, in informal situations and then tú without that written accent is a possessive adjective and we are going to use it when as we were doing in the previous examples when we want to establish a possession or a relationship for example within our family if i say tú casa then that means your house and we don't need to write a tilde a written accent in that tú and if i say tú eres marta see you are marta here we are using the the person tú means you in this case you are marta something else that we need to talk about is vosotros vosotros means you all in spain and in latin america we don't use vosotros we use ustedes so just like vosotros all the possessive adjectives for vosotros which mean, which would actually mean in english your okay uh, all these possessive adjectives in as, as spanish will only be used in spain specifically and we also have four just like with nosotros can you remember those we're gonna say vuestro vuestra vuestros and vuestras so vuestro vuestra vuestros and vuestras would only be used in spain for example vuestro tío es gerardo vuestro tío es gerardo so your uncle is gerardo vuestra profesora es romina vuestra profesora es romina 
Your teacher is Romina. Vuestros carros son grandes. Vuestros carros son grandes. Your cars are big. Vuestras amigas son guapas. Vuestras amigas son guapas. Your friends are good looking. The meaning of su and sus depend on the context and could mean his, her, your, your for formal register, your for the plural, and also their. Let's have a look at some examples. Tengo novio. Su nombre es Javier. As you can see here, context will help us a lot to have a look at what these su or sus mean. If you say tengo novio, that means I have a boyfriend. So we know that when I say su nombre, I'm referring to the boyfriend. So in this case, we know that su means his name is Javier. Let's have a look at, at another example. Nuestra abuela es Gladys. Nuestra abuela es Gladys. Su esposo es José. What do you think su means here? Nuestra abuela es Gladys. Our grandmother is Gladys. And then we're talking about her husband. Yes, yeah? so we're going to say her husband is José. Mucho gusto, señor. ¿Cuál es su nombre? ¿Cuál es su nombre? What do you think su means here? Mucho gusto. Nice to meet you, sir. What is your name? And this is a formal situation. It means your. Ustedes son de Francia. Ustedes son de Francia. Sus nombres son franceses. Sus nombres son franceses. As you can see here, context, we have ustedes. So we know that sus nombres son franceses, see? So uh, your names are French. Are, are you from France? Yes. We know that your names, uh, your names would be sus in this case. And the last one, tengo tres hijos. Sus nombres son María, Pedro y Luis. Again, when we say tengo tres hijos and then we are naming these children, yes? I have three kids and now I'm talking about their names. We're talking about their. So sus in this case means their. Their names are María, Pedro and Luis. Muy bien, es hora de practicar. Vamos a hacer algunos ejercicios. Now it's time to practice. Let's do some exercises. Completa los espacios en blanco con el adjetivo posesivo correspondiente. So now you have to fill in the blanks with the corresponding possessive adjective. Respuesta. Ella es mi mamá. Ellos son mis padres. Nuestra familia es muy grande. Tu abuela es muy dulce. Pedro y Luis son nuestros tíos. Sus primos son muy amables. Su abuelo es Manuel y sus tías son Julia y Ana. Su hermana es Clara. Mi prima Sofía es muy bonita. Su hermano mayor es Germán. Vuestra hermana es Rosa. Vuestros tíos tienen una casa grande en Madrid. Ok, so that is all for today. I really hope that now you understand how to use the possessive adjectives in Spanish. Thank you very much for watching this class. Muchísimas gracias y nos vemos en la próxima. I will see you next class. Adiós, hasta luego. Hola, soy Brenda Romagnello, tu profesora de español. Hi, my name is Brenda Romagnello and I'm your Spanish teacher. Today we're going to have a look at some basic conversation questions and answers to talk about you and your family. One of the common questions that always come up whenever you're having a conversation with Spanish speakers is about you and your family. Who do you live with? Uh, do you have any siblings? Do you have pets? 
all these sort of questions are basic conversational questions that always come up whenever we are talking to people in general and that is not the exception when you're talking to Spanish speakers as well. Today I'm going to help you to know which, uh, what questions these questions are so that you can also ask your Spanish friends when you're in conversations with them and then we'll have a look at potential answers so that you can also improve your Spanish and your communication and conversational skills. As you're going to talk about you and your family, let's have a look at some vocabulary for family members in Spanish. Repeat after me. Repite después de mí. Madre. Madre. Mamá. Mamá. Padre. Padre. Papá. Papá. So the difference between madre and mamá padre and papa is of course that madre and padre are a little bit more formal and mamá y papá are a little bit more informal. Hijo, hijo, hija, hija. Remember in Spanish the H is silent so as you can see in hijo and hija we don't pronounce the H here it's not hijo or hija yes <laughs> it's just hijo, hija. Hermano, hermano, hermana, hermana, tío, tío, tía, tía, sobrino, sobrino, sobrina, sobrina, primo, primo, prima, prima, abuelo, Abuelo, abuela, abuela, bisabuelo, bisabuelo, bisabuela, bisabuela, nieto, nieto, nieta, nieta. Now we're going to learn some adjectives that we can use to describe, for example, brothers and sisters and also children, yes, your children, whether they are uh, an uh, only child or for example to say that they are the oldest, the eldest, the youngest, the one in the middle, etc. Único, único, única, única, mayor, mayor, la del medio, la del medio, Menor, menor, gemelo, gemelo, gemela, gemela, mellizo, mellizo, melliza, melliza. For twins in Spanish we're gonna have gemelos and mellizos. So gemelos are identical twins and mellizos are going to be fraternal twins. Let's see how we can use this vocabulary in sentences uh, to describe your family members, especially when we're talking about sons and daughters, if you want to say you are a, an only child or if you, have, if you are the oldest or the youngest, if you have older siblings or younger siblings. Por ejemplo, soy hijo único, soy hija única, See, sí, I'm an only child, soy la hija mayor. Soy el hijo del medio. Soy la hija menor. Tengo un hermano mayor. Tengo una hermana mayor. Tengo dos hermanos menores. Tengo dos hermanas mayores. Soy la hija del medio. Tengo un hermano mayor y una hermana menor. Sí, aquí hija es opcional. Here, hija is op optional. You can say, soy la del medio. Soy el del medio. Eh, sí, I'm, I'm in the middle. <laughs> eh, tengo un hermano mayor y tengo una hermana menor. Sí, be careful here also when you say hermano. When you want to say a brother, we have to say un hermano. It's, es incorrecto. It's incorrect to say uno hermano. 
So those are basically your uh, immediate family members. Now let's have a look at your in-laws or when you get married or when people get married, what are the relationships, these new family additions and how to say those in Spanish. Suegro, suegro, suegra, suegra. So suegro is father-in-law, suegra, mother-in-law. Nuera, nuera is just the femenino form and that means daughter-in-law. Yerno, yerno, yerno is son-in-law. Esposo, esposo, esposa, esposa. Ex-esposo, ex-esposo, ex-esposa, ex-esposa. Marido significa husband, so it's a sinónimo, it's a sinónim of esposo and mujer is wife and it also, remember, a sinónim is esposa. Prometido, prometido, prometida, prometida. Sí, prometido is fiancé and prometida fiancé. <laughs> novio, novio, novia, novia. Amante, madrastra, madrastra, padrastro, padrastro. Okay, that's a long list of vocabulary, but that's basically all the family members that you can possibly have, most family members that you can have in Spanish. ¿Cómo es tu familia? What is your family like? In Spanish, whenever we want to say something general, for example, children or kids, or if you want to talk about your grandchildren, or if you want to talk about uh, your parents, etc., we're going to use the masculino plural for a general in Spanish. If I ask, ¿Tienes hijos? Do you have sons? Yeah, will be the literal translation because we know that hijo is son in the singular and masculino, so then hijos uh, will pro probably mean sons, yes, yeah? so the plural for the hijo. But in Spanish, if it's in a question, it means do you have children, okay? Do you have children? It could be both sons and daughters. Let's have a look at another example. ¿Tienes hermanos? ¿Tienes hermanos? Here we are using the plural masculine hermanos for general information. We aren't asking if you have brothers, but rather if you have siblings. So a possible answer to this would be C. Sí, tengo dos hermanos y dos hermanas. Tengo dos hermanos y dos hermanas. Yes, I do. I have two brothers and two sisters. So in this case, even if we're asking for hermanos, yes, the general would be we're asking for siblings. So if you have brothers and sisters, you need to specify both. Let's say that if you want to talk about your siblings and you only have one, then you are going to use the non-specific article a, yes, or an in English. We're going to say un o una, un and una, which also means one in Spanish, okay? So you can say, tengo un hermano, tengo un hermano, see, I have a brother, or I have one brother, tengo una hermana, tengo una hermana, I have a sister. So remember, that is not correct to say uno before the masculine singular noun, so you cannot say Tengo uno tío, tengo uno hermano, tengo uno primo. You have to say un here. Tengo un tío, tengo un hermano, tengo un primo. Now, if you have many siblings, you can use mayor for older and menor for younger. Remember to place the adjective after what we are describing, so be careful with the plural form. Let's have a look at an example here. Tengo un hermano mayor y una hermana menor. Sí, tengo un hermano mayor y una hermana menor. I have an older brother and a younger sister. Tengo dos hermanos mayores. Tengo dos hermanos mayores y dos hermanas menores. Y dos hermanas menores. Tengo dos hermanos mayores 
y dos hermanas menores. I have two older brothers and two younger sisters. So as you can see here, we're saying dos hermanos in the plural. See, I have two brothers, older brothers. So we have to say mayores and then I have two younger sisters, hermanas menores. Muy bien, perfecto. Now let's move to the part where we ask basic questions about you and your family in Spanish. Pregunta número uno. ¿Con quién vives? ¿Con quién vives? Who do you live with? ¿Con quién vives? Here are a few possible answers. Respuestas posibles. Vivo con mi esposo o vivo con mi esposa, vivo solo, vivo sola, vivo con mi familia, vivo con mis padres, etc. Pregunta número 2. ¿Tienes hermanos? ¿Tienes hermanos? Do you have siblings? You can answer this question in an affirmative way and you can say, sí, tengo un hermano y una hermana. Yes, I have a brother and I have a sister. Or if you, have, if you want to give a negative answer, you can say, no, no tengo hermanos. No tengo hermanos. So pay attention here that we have two no's in this answer. We're going to have no, the first one, because we're answering to the question. ¿Tienes hermanos? No. See, do you have siblings? No. No tengo. See, I don't have. So the second no is to negate the verb. No, no tengo. No, I don't. Pregunta número tres. ¿Tienes tíos? ¿Tienes tíos? So here, remember, we're using the masculino plural for general and that means do you have aunties or uncles? Respuesta afirmativa, sí, tengo un tío y una tía. Sí, tengo un tío y una tía. Respuesta negativa, no, no tengo tíos. No, I don't. I don't have any aunties or uncles. So pay attention here that in the negative answer, we are also having it and keeping it in the plural form because it's general. Pregunta número cuatro. ¿Tienes primos? Do you have cousins? Sí, tengo ocho primos y una prima. Yes, I have eight cousins and one cousin. So remember that in Spanish we're going to have female cousins and male cousins. So ocho primos is male cousins and una prima would be a female uh, cousin. Respuesta negativa, no, no tengo primos. Pregunta número 5. ¿Tienes hijos? Sí, tengo un hijo y una hija. No, no tengo hijos. Pregunta número 6. ¿Tienes sobrinos? Sí, tengo tres sobrinos y dos sobrinas. So remember, sobrinos is going to be nephews and sobrinas, nieces. Y la última pregunta es la pregunta número 7. This is the last question. ¿Tienes mascotas? Sí, tengo un perro y una gata. Yes, I have a dog and a cat, a female cat. But if you have a male cat, then you have to say, sí, tengo un perro y un gato. And la respuesta negativa, no, no tengo mascotas. And something important to remember for your conversations in Spanish, when we have a conversation, if we have things in common, instead of repeating it, see, for example, if someone has a pet, yes, they have a dog, si, sí, tengo un perro, instead of you saying, ah, yo tengo un perro, you, have, you, you can say, yo también, yo también, me too, yo también. And then if they, if they say, for example, no tengo mascotas, I don't have pets, then instead of repeating, if you don't have pets either, then you can say, yo tampoco, yo tampoco, me neither, me neither or neither do I. 
fabuloso good job thank you so much for watching today's class and now i want you to comment below um, answer to these two questions that i would love to know about you from the questions that we had a look into today number one numero uno tienes hermanos let me know if you have siblings and number two tienes mascotas do you have pets let me know in the comments below using the answers that we have learned today Muchísimas gracias por ver esta clase. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next class. Adiós. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Mi nombre es Romina. Soy tu profesora de español para la clase de hoy. Hi, ¿cómo estás? How are you? My name is Romina. I'm your Spanish teacher for today's lesson. En la clase de hoy voy a explicarte los pronombres demostrativos en español. For today's lesson, I'm going to teach you the demonstrative pronouns in Spanish. So first things first, what is, it? What is a pronoun? Pronouns are words that replace nouns and the idea is to avoid repetition. Demonstrative pronouns, as their name uh, indicates demonstrative comes from latin and it means to show to pinpoint um, so basically um, the the demonstrative are a an, an specific category of pronouns that what they do is they pinpoint exactly what we are talking about okay so basically we use them a lot when we are pointing out things okay Vamos a ver esto con un ejemplo. Es mucho más fácil de comprender con un ejemplo. So we're going to see this with an example because obviously it's a lot easier to understand with an example. Qué lindas flores. Estas me gustan mucho. Lovely flowers. Oh, what a beautiful flowers. I like these ones very much. So in this example, estas is the demonstrative pronoun which is replacing flores. It is replacing the word flowers in the second sentence. What estas is doing is to pinpoint exactly which flowers are the ones that I like very much. Which flowers out of all the flowers I'm uh, surrendered with are the ones that I like very much. Another thing is to um, use the, this demonstrative pronoun, um, estas, to avoid the repetition of the word flores in the second sentence. Y, so another thing um, for, for you guys to notice in this sentence, is in, in this example, is the fact that I'm mentioning the word flo, uh, flores in the first sentence. So um, when I'm using, the, I'm using the word estas, you already have a context. You already know what I'm talking about. Bien, continuamos. Let's continue. Did you notice the ending of estas? ¿Has notado la terminación de la palabra estas? Esa terminación AS, the ending in AS. ¿Qué es eso? What is that? So, estas está en femenino y plural. So, estas is in, a, in the feminine form and also in the plural form. So, the reason for this is because the demonstrative pronouns in Spanish have to match with the noun they're replacing in gender and in number. Okay? Las flores, because the flowers, flowers are, um, it's a feminine and a plural word, okay? Um, I'm going to have to use estas to replace it because that's also in feminine and plural. I believe that this is what makes the pronouns in Spanish just a little bit more difficult than English, if you compare it with English. Um, and this is because in Spanish we have four options to, to select from, right? Um, depending if it's ma uh, masculine, feminine, singular, or plural, okay? So if it's masculine and sing singular, you're going to use este, the very first example, este, the very first word, sorry. Um, if it's masculine and plural, you're going to go estos, and then if it's feminine and singular, you're going to say esta, and plural is estas. Let's practice the pronunciation. Este. Estos, 
esta, estas. In Spanish, another complication that we have is the distance, okay? So depending on how far away we are from the object that we are referring to, that, that we are talking about, we are going to use three, um, either one of the three uh, demonstrative pronouns we have in Spanish. So if the object is nearby you and you can touch it, for example, you are going to use este. So when it's cerca, when it's nearby you, when it's cerca, you're going to, to use este. But if the object that you're talking about is very far away from you, you're going to be using aquel. So, si el objeto está lejos, so lejos means far. If it's far away from you, you're going to use aquel. So if the object is somewhere in between, it's not too close and it's not too far away from you, then you're going to use ese. We have three options, while in English we have only two. So I will leave that the closest translation you have for this is that este is used as, is translated as this, while ese and aquel are translated usually as that, but I think aquel is mostly translated as that one over there. Okay, so you're saying that it's very far away. So the crazy thing is that we have four options for each one of these three options. Again, depending if it's a female, a, sorry, a feminine or a masculine, or if it's singular or if it's plural. Okay, don't forget the translations. These, that, those, that one over there, those ones over there. Vamos a practicar la pronunciación, okay? Let's start with the very first ones, okay? The ones at the very top of your screen. Repite, por favor. Please repeat after me. Este. Este. Esta. Esta. Estos, estos, estas, estas. Vamos con el siguiente cuadro. Let's move on to the next um, chart, the next table. Ese, ese, esa. Esa, esos, esos, esas, esas. Ahora vamos al tercer cuadro. So now we go to the third uh, table. Aquel, aquel. Aquella, aquella, aquellos, aquellos, aquellas, aquellas. Please remember that because I'm from Argentina, my pronunciation um, is a little bit different and um, for the double L, I would say aquella, no? So in other countries of, um, just remember that in other countries of Latin America and in Spain as well, the pronunciation will be different. And instead of aquella, um, you will hear people saying aquella. Okay, let's practice that pronunciation for a second. Eh, vamos con el femenino singular. Let's, let's start with the feminine and singular. Aquella. Aquella, aquellos, aquellos, aquellas, aquellas. In this lesson, I'm, I'm just teaching you the demonstrative pronouns that um, are uh, feminine or masculine, okay, that belong to these uh, grammatical genders in Spanish. 
Uh, I want you to know that uh, there is a third gender. There is another gender in Spanish, which is the neutral gender. Okay. Um, however, <laughs> these are just a little bit more complicated. Okay. Uh, demonstrative pronouns of uh, the neutral gender is just a little bit difficult at this stage to be understood or used. Um, so this is something that we prefer to teach you later on in your on your Spanish journey. Okay. So just be patient. It will come eventually. Un poco de paciencia. Bien. Es momento de practicar. We need to practice. Please complete the sentences with the correct uh, demonstrative pronoun. Underneath each uh, incomplete sentence, you have the translation in English. Um, just take a moment. Pause this video right now before I show you uh, on screen the answers, las respuestas correctas, okay? Muy bien, vamos a ver las respuestas. Okay, very good. We are going to see the answers. Let's check out the answers. Número uno, esta Copa es mía. Esa es la tuya. Número dos. Aquel que está al final de la calle es mi auto. Número tres. Estas son mis hermanas. Se llaman Agustina y Julieta. Número cuatro. Esos son mejores que estos. Número cinco y final. So this is the last one. Este es mi papá. Esa es mi mamá. Y aquellos son mis abuelos. Bien, amigos, es el final de la clase. Muchas gracias por ver esta lección. Um, okay, my friends, this is the end of the lesson. Thank you so much for watching this video. Y nos vemos en la próxima clase. Adiós. Thank you so much. I will see you in our next class. Bye. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Mi nombre es Romina. Soy tu profesora de español de hoy. Um, Hi everybody, how are you today? This is Romina and I'm your Spanish teacher for today. So in today's lesson, I'm going to give you memory tips um, to make it easy for you to memorize the numbers in Spanish from zero to a hundred. Besides uh, helping you to memorize numbers up until a hundred, I'm also going to give you tips um, to um, on how to memorize or how to say correctly the years in Spanish, okay? That the, the most basic years. So from zero to 15, unfortunately, we have no other option but to memorize the numbers by heart, okay? Vamos a practicar la pronunciación. Por favor, repite después de mí. So let's practice pronunciation. Please repeat after me. Cero. Uno. Dos. Tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez, once, doce, trece, catorce, quince. The only memory tip, it's a small memory tip that I can give you, it's uh, the fact that the numbers from 11 to 15 end in C, in the sound C. So C, E. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, continuamos. Okay, let's move on. From the numbers from 16 to 19, um, where what we are basically doing in Spanish, we're saying 10 and the, the number afterwards. So it will be in this example, 16 in Spanish is 10 and 6. Okay. Um, 
the the thing is that as you can see on screen is a uh, um, 10 and 6 are three words but we said them fast and we fuse these three words into one okay and as you can see on screen z becomes c and y becomes i vamos a practicar la pronunciación let's practice the pronunciation por favor repite please repeat 16 17 18 19 so the same thing happens when we go to count numbers from 21 to 29, okay? We are literally saying in Spanish 20 and the, 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 name, the number afterwards, 20 and 1, 20 and 2, 20 and 3, etc. One thing to keep in mind is the pronunciation of the number 20 in Spanish against the rest of the numbers of, uh, um, with 20, so 21, 22, 23. 20 in Spanish has its ending in E, 20, 20. But the rest of the numbers do it in I, okay? 20, see? So that's something to keep in mind, okay? Uh, vamos a practicar la pronunciación. Let's practice pronunciation. Repite. 20, 21, 22. 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 Again, in this example, um, with these numbers, you can see that um, the three words 20 and 1 are fused into one word. Okay, we say that very quickly. And then the vowel E and the consonant Y uh, can kind of fuse together into I. Okay, so here you can already see that it's very important to know by heart the numbers from 1 to 9 because we're actually using them all the time. I believe that from this point onwards, numbers in Spanish becomes, um, it, it gets easier to memorize the numbers in Spanish. Numbers get easier from this point onwards because we are using the exact same structure I was mentioning before about 20 and 1, 20 and 2, um, etc. But um, this time we are not fusing or changing the words in any way. We have three words and that's the structure, that's the way we write it, okay? So 31 in Spanish is 30 and 1, 30 y 1, 32 it's 30 y 2, 30 and 2 and etc. Okay, and the same thing happens with the rest of the numbers. So 40 it's, um, 41 sorry, it's 40 and 1, 42, 40 and 2, 40 y 1, 40 y 2, etc. So it's bastante fácil. So it's fairly simple, we, we can say. Bien, let's practice the, the tens or the decimals, no? Eh, repite, por favor, please repeat. Treinta. Cuarenta. Cincuenta. Sesenta. 70, 80, 90. To make um, memorizing easier, uh, you're going to notice that these numbers end in NTA. Okay, they all end uh, on the same three letters NTA. So that ta sound, no? 30, 40. 50. Another thing to keep in mind is the difference between 60 and 70. It's quite common to get these two mixed up. Um, so just uh, bear in mind, 60 is se, se, 60. And 70 is sete, 70. 
a lot of students also get confused with the pronunciation of 90 in Spanish. Um, they will say nueventa, like um, they're trying to uh, put the pronunciation of number nine into 90, nueventa, y, and unfortunately that's incorrect, okay? You have to say o, oh, no venta. Okay, continuamos, continuamos. So I want to give you a memory tip for, for the number five, and it's um, the numbers related to number five. So we are talking about five, 50, 15, and 500. Okay, I know we haven't seen the hundreds in here, um, but I thought I should include it here um, so you have, it, you have everything in one place. Um, so 5 and 50 share the same uh, st uh, stem or, or root <laughs> and then 15 and 500 also share the, the stem or, or the root, okay? So we have 5, 50, so 5, 50, 5, 50, but then 15, 500, okay? Vamos, repite por favor, 5. 50, 5, 50, 15, 500, 15, 500. So the idea of this diagram is just to help you memorize in these numbers, just so you don't get confused. We reach to number 100. Um, unfortunately, I have no tips to give you for 100. Okay, so you just have to memorize it by heart. Uh, but you know, it's fairly easy. It's, a, it's only how many? Four letters? Por favor, repite. 100. 100. Muy bien, perfect. Okay, so now um, we're going to quickly. Um, uh, go through how to pronounce the years in Spanish, but obviously I'm not going to teach you how to uh, say every single year <laughs> from zero to you know <laughs> uh, the infinity, the infinite, because uh, it, it will be end up being a very long video. But I'm going to teach you the two most important years, um, especially for beginners. Okay, so that is, is saying 19. Uh, 1910, 1970, 1930, or 2010, 2020, etc. Um, this is because obviously these are the years that you're going to be using more often uh, in the beginning of your Spanish journey. Um, okay, so here on the on the little box at, at the top of your screen, we have two examples. We have 1970 and 2010. Okay, let's pronounce 1970 in, in Spanish. Vamos a pronunciar en español. 1970. Repite. 1970. So basically what we're saying here in Spanish is a thousand nine hundred seventy. Okay, that, that's what we're saying. Let's continue with 2010. So we're saying in Spanish 2010. That's what we're saying, okay? Repite. Dos mil diez. Dos mil diez. Okay, perfecto. So um, the structure is fairly easy. Um, for uh, 1,900, you just put whatever number follows after that, right? So um, you want to say to the, uh, 1,010, uh, 1910, uh, 1920. So you just say 1,900 plus 10, right? So 1,910. 1920 1930 etc okay and the same thing with 2000 okay just say the number at the end 2000 
2010. 2020. 2030. 2040. ¿Ok? Repite, por favor. 1910. 1920. 1930. 1940. 2010. 2020. 2030. 2040. Thank you so much for watching um, this lesson. Muchísimas gracias y nos vemos en la próxima clase. Thank you so much and I will see you on our next class. Adiós. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hola, this is Brenda, your Spanish teacher. Today we're going to have a look at the difference between ser and estar, but specifically to talk about locations compared to events. As you know, we have two different verbs to say to be in Spanish. We're going to have ser and estar. So because we only have one verb in English, we need to learn when we use one verb and when we use the other verb in Spanish. One of the things that are very distinctive between these two verbs in Spanish is that we're going to use el verbo ser to talk about events. Anything that is related to the event, including the location, will use el verbo ser and not estar. And for locations in general, just to say where things or yourself or other people are located, then we're going to use el verbo estar. Let's start with el verbo estar in this specific case because we know for sure that whenever we have a location, 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 we're going to use el verbo estar. So let's have a look at some examples. Estoy en la universidad. Marta, ¿dónde estás? Él está en el café. El banco está en la calle Colón. ¿Dónde está el baño? ¿Dónde está el restaurante? Colombia está en Sudamérica. Estamos en México de vacaciones. So you can see all these examples. Uh, we have either people or things uh, in a location. Whenever we want to talk about a location, we're going to use el verbo estar and not ser. It would be incorrect to use el verbo ser for any of these examples. Let's talk about events. So what is an event? An event, it would be anything that is um, that organized. For example, an event could be a party, fiesta. It could be, um, yes, like a party, but including a birthday party, end of the year party, any sort of party, housewarming party, anything party. It could be a concert or a play, a movie, etc. For anything that is an event, we'll use the verb ser and not estar, including the location. Let's have a look at this example. La fiesta es el viernes. La fiesta es a las 8 de la noche. La fiesta es en mi casa. So have a look at here. So we have for the date and time, we know that we have to use the verbo ser. So the party is on Friday, it is at 8 p.m. But pay attention to this. La fiesta es en mi casa. 
In this case, we're talking about a location, but can you see that we're using the verb ser in this case? And that is because we're talking about the location of the event. I'm not asking where your house is, I'm asking or we're giving information about the location of the party, the event itself. Now, if someone didn't know where I lived or didn't know my address, we'll say, perfect, I got it, that's the event location. ¿Dónde está tu casa? Where is your house? Because now we're not talking about the event, now we're talking about the house, the location of the house. We need to switch to the verbo estar. I know it could be a little confusing of thinking, oh my God, is this an event? Is this a location? It's very simple. An event, remember, is a concert or a party or any gathering that is important. So a little trick to use if you're not sure is to replace the verb with ta is taking place. If it makes sense, you know that you're using the verb ser correctly. So let's have a look at this. La fiesta es en mi casa. The party is taking place in my house. It makes sense? Sí, creo que sí. El concierto es en el estadio. The concert is in the stadium. The concert is taking place in the stadium. ¿Tiene sentido? Does it make sense? Yes, so you know that you're using the verb correctly. El banco es en la avenida Colón. So, the bank is taking place in Colón Avenue. I don't think that doesn't make sense, okay? Eh, mi casa es en el norte. My house is taking place in the north. It doesn't make sense. So if it doesn't make sense, you know that you're using the verb ser incorrectly for the, it's not an event, it's a location, and you need to use the verb estar instead. And if you want to replace the verb estar in these cases, you can replace it with is located. Uh, por ejemplo, el banco está en la avenida Colón. The bank is located in Columbus Avenue. Mi casa está en el norte. My house is north. Uh, my house is located north. Let's try this with the events. La fiesta está en mi casa. The party is located in my house. Maybe. Sounds a bit weird. El concierto es... El concierto está en el estadio. The concert is located in the stadium. It doesn't quite make sense because it's taking place. It is a one-time occasion. Muy bien, I really hope that you found this uh, lesson useful and that now you understand the difference between ser and estar in terms of location when we talk about general location of things or people and when we are talking specifically about events. Muchas gracias, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next class. Adios, hasta luego. Hola, soy Brenda, tu profesora de español. Today we're going to talk about 10 different phrases that we use with the verbo tener. El verbo tener, as you may or may not know, it's a, uh, it means to have in English. And it's a verb that we use to talk about possession mostly. And it's the same way that you, we use it in English to talk about possessions. For example, tengo tres hermanos, I have three brothers. Now, there are some differences between Spanish and English that sometimes we use el verbo tener, the verb to have in Spanish, and we use a complete different verb for these expressions that I'm going to share with you today in English. We use the verb to be. Número uno, tener with años. So, we are going to use the verb tener in Spanish to talk about age. So, in English, we would say I am, and then however old uh, you are. In Spanish, we're going to say that we possess years in Spanish and we're going to use the verb uh, to have and say you have these many years. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense in English, but that's the way that we use it in Spanish. Por ejemplo, tengo 34 años. ¿Cuántos años tienes? How old are you? Número 2. Tengo hambre. Tengo hambre means I am hungry. So we use el verbo tener here again, which means to have, to say that we are hungry. I have hunger would be the literal translation, which doesn't make any sense in English, but it does in Spanish. We have to remember to use the verb to have, 
tener when we talk about hunger in Spanish. Tengo hambre. ¿Tienes hambre? Número 3. Tengo sed. So we talked about hambre before and it's, it's the same thing with thirst. In español, we're going to use the verb uh, tener, to have, to talk about thirst. So if you want to say, I am thirsty, you have to say, tengo sed. ¿Tienes sed? Número cuatro. Tengo miedo a. So we use this phrase to talk about fear. And when we want to say, I am scared about something, uh, we have to use this expression with the verbo tener en español. So we have to say, tengo miedo a, and then you can use any nouns, any sustantivos, por ejemplo. Uh, remember, you have to use the article before uh, the nouns here. So we'll say, tengo miedo a las arañas, tengo miedo a los tiburones, or you can say, um, you can use a verb if you are scared of an activity. For example, tengo miedo a bucear. Número 5. Number 5. Tengo sueño. Uh, 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 tengo sueño. Tengo sueño means I am sleepy. Tengo sueño. I am sleepy. Uh, so again, we use this expression when, for example, you are in class and you are very sleepy, you probably didn't have a great night's sleep. So you can say and use this expression, tengo sueño. Now be careful, some of my students uh, use it in the plural form, tengo sueños. And in that case, sueños would mean dream. So I have dreams, right? Uh, so in this case, it is a possession. Uh, we're talking about the dreams that you have, uh, kind of like goals. But if you want to say that you're sleepy, then use it in the singular form. Tengo sueño. Número 6. Number 6. Tengo prisa. Tengo prisa. Tener prisa significa to be in a hurry. So I am in a, in a hurry would be tengo prisa. I am in a hurry. So we use this expression, for example, when you're going to work and you're running a little bit late or when you're going to the airport to catch a, a plane, uh, if you're going to a meeting or to the gym, anything that, inquire, that implies a schedule and you're running a little bit late, you can use this expression. Tengo prisa. Yeah, so for example, if you're running to someone in the middle of the street as you are going or getting late to a, to a different location, you can say, Lo siento, tengo prisa. I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. I have to go. Número siete. Number seven. Tener calor. To be hot. <laughs> Tener calor significa to be hot, but not as I am like, ooh, I'm good looking. Oh yeah. No, no, no. Tener calor significa in terms of the weather and the temperature when it's hot. I think we in English you say, oh, I'm hot, I'm hot. Sometimes I think we say more like it's hot as uh, to talk about the weather and not yourself, right? So, tengo calor significa it's hot, I am actually hot, it's really hot. Hmm? Número 8. Number 8. Tener frío. Tener frío significa to be cold, which is the opposite of the previous one that we, that we said before. We talked about tener calor. Tener frío es lo opuesto. So, tener frío is the opposite of tener calor. So, tener frío is the same. We use it to talk about the weather and how it makes you feel this temperature. And we say, tengo frío. I am cold. Número 9. Number 9. Tener ganas de. Tener ganas de is an expression that we use in Spanish and it means to feel like doing something. We don't even use the verb to be for this one, it's to feel like doing something. Por ejemplo, and remember, because we have a preposition here in Spanish, ganas de, we are going to use a verb in the infinity form after that preposition. So we can say, for example, tengo ganas de ir al cine. I feel like going to the movies. Tengo ganas de bailar salsa. I feel like dancing salsa. Tengo ganas de hablar y estudiar español. I feel like talking and studying Spanish. 
etc. You can just pretty much use any verb in the infinitive form to talk about what you feel like with the verb tener in Spanish. Tener ganas de. Tengo ganas de. Número 10. Number 10. Finally, the last expression with the verb tener in Espanol that I'm going to teach you today is tener dolor de. Tener dolor de. So this expression means to be sore or to hurt in some part of your body. Tener dolor de. So, por ejemplo, vamos a ver unos ejemplos. Let's have a look at some examples. Tener dolor de cabeza. To have a headache. Tener dolor de estómago. To have a stomachache. Tener dolor de muelas to have a toothache, etc. Muy bien, esas son 10 expresiones con el verbo tener en español. Those are the 10 phrases with the verb tener that I want to share with you today. Muchas gracias por ver esta lección y nos vemos en la próxima clase. Thank you so much for watching this lesson and I will see you next class. Adiós. Hola, hola. Soy Romina Romañelo. Mucho gusto. Soy tu profesora de español. Hi guys, my name is Romina Romañelo. I'm your Spanish teacher. Hoy tengo seis expresiones con el verbo gustar o relacionadas al verbo gustar para ti. Today I have six expressions uh, with the verb gustar, which means to like, or related to this verb in Spanish. Número uno. Mucho gusto. Repite, por favor. Mucho gusto. You probably know this one already, no? Mucho gusto is probably one of the first sentences that you learn when you start uh, learning Spanish, no? ¿Qué significa? What does it mean? ¿Qué significa mucho gusto? Vamos, tell me. Ajá. Uh -huh. Pleased to meet you, okay? Nice to meet you. That's what mucho gusto significa, okay? So the literal translation of mucho gusto is actually a lot of pleasure, uh, a pleasure um, to meet you, to, to come to acquaintance with you. Sort of like, what a pleasure to meet you. Número dos. No me gusta nada. Repite, por favor. Please repeat. No me gusta nada. No me gusta nada. Probablemente has escuchado a muchos latinos o españoles decir esta frase. You probably heard a lot of Latinos and Spaniards saying this phrase. Um, it's a little bit dramatic, just like we are. And uh, basically we're saying like we don't like something at all. Para nada. It's very, very emphatic, okay? Para nada. The, the literal translation is I don't like it at all. I don't like it for, for nothing. Like, I don't like nothing of it. Okay, it's very uh, dramatic. Okay, so if you find yourself in a formal setting uh, with people that you don't know very well, um, it's very important for you not to actually say this phrase because it can be a little bit harsh. Okay, it's not offensive or it's not a bad word or anything like that, but uh, just be mindful that it's just a little bit uh, dramatic, a little bit too emphatic, no? So please, just use it when you're surrounded by people that you feel very comfortable with. Número tres. Yo gusto de salir a cenar. Repite, por favor. Yo gusto de salir a cenar. Muy bien. So the phrase that I'm focusing in here is actually yo gusto de. And then an activity, right? You can say, like in this example, um, to go out to have dinner uh, or pretty much anything else you like, ¿no? ¿Qué te gusta hacer? What, what is it that you like to do? Yo gusto de mirar películas. I enjoy to uh, watching movies. I like to watch movies. So basically what you're saying is that these are the activities that you're fond of, okay? Um, instead of like saying, I enjoy doing these things. 
Uh, I enjoy going to the movies with my friends. Yo gusto de uh, ir al cine con mis amigos. I enjoy um, uh, having drinks with uh, my mom. <laughs> Thanks, mom. Um, yo, dice, yo gusto de beber con mi mamá. <laughs> Número cuatro. María gusta de Carlos. Repite, por favor. Please repeat. María gusta de Carlos. María gusta de Carlos. So here we are, we are being a little bit uh, gossip and we are telling people that María likes Charles. Yes, we, we usually teach our students that gustar um, is a verb that we use to talk about food, no? Like, I like burgers, me gustan las hamburguesas, uh, I like fruits, me gustan las frutas, uh, I like fish, me gusta el pescado, pero también es perfectamente posible utilizar gustar para hablar de personas y de sentimientos. So it's perfectly possible to use the verb gustar to talk about people uh, that we like, romantically speaking, that we feel attracted to, uh, that we are talking about our feelings, no? To talk about people and fe uh, feelings, it's perfectly possible to use el verbo gustar. So in this case, we were just saying, María likes Charles. Número 5. Me gustan algunas canciones de Shakira. Repite, por favor. Me gustan algunas canciones de Shakira. Es una mentira. Me gustan todas las canciones de Shakira. A mí me gusta muchísimo Shakira. So the, the thing that we're saying here is... Um, I like some of Shakira's song. Me gustan algunas canciones. So when people ask you, hey, do you like this? Te gusta Shakira? O te gusta Colombia? O te gusta Argentina? Te gusta viajar? Lo que sea. When people are asking you, uh, do you like doing this? Do you like doing that? Um, in that case, let's imagine that you do like these things, but you don't want to make it sound that you're you know, a massive big fan of something. It's actually a phrase that we use quite a lot in, in Latin America because we don't want to be disrespectful, for example, when we don't, uh, we don't like an artist. And we would still like to say like, yeah, yeah, I like Shakira, I like some of her songs, right? It doesn't mean that you bought every single disc of Shakira or that you have a Shakira t-shirt in your house and your whole house is decorated with her uh, photos. Um, you, but you are aware of her, you like some of her songs and yes, you like her. So you, you can say just that. Me gustan algunas canciones de Shakira. Y finalmente, número 6. ¿Puede gustar o no gustar? Repite, por favor. ¿Puede gustar o no gustar? So, this phrase is translated into English as whether we like it or not. Of course, it depends on the, on the context, no? If, uh, you're going to be translating this whether we like it or not, if you're talking about yourself, including a group of people, we, right? Whether we like it or not, we have to do this. Puede gustar o no gustar, pero tenemos que hacer esto. So we like it, whether we like it or not, we have to do this. But in other contexts, for example, where you're referring to other people, right? Um, then of course the translation is gonna change a little bit, no? Uh, let's say, for example, Puede gustar o no gustar, pero la gente necesita pagar sus impuestos. Uh, eh, whether people like it or not, um, they will have to pay taxes. They have to pay their taxes. People need to pay their taxes. Muy bien, es el final del video. Muchísimas gracias por ver esta clase. It's the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching this lesson. Um, I want to hear from you. If you have any questions, let me know down below, okay? In the comments down below. Si tienes preguntas, por favor, me dejas un mensaje en los comentarios. Y también, yo quiero saber de ti. I want to know from you. 
Um, ¿Ya conocías estas frases? Did you know these phrases already? Which ones did you know? Okay, let me know in the comments. And if you know any other uh, phrases that you heard in Spanish related to the verb gustar, I would also love to hear that from you. Muchísimas gracias y nos vemos. Adiós. Hola, mi nombre es Romina. Mucho gusto. Hello, my name is Romina. Nice to meet you. Uh, today I have a very good topic for you. Today we're going to talk about contracciones en español. Today we're going to talk about contractions in Spanish, Spanish contractions, okay? Which sounds painful, like giving birth, <laughs> but it's not. And although contracciones sounds really, really difficult to pronounce in Spanish, if you practice a few times, it's not so hard. Repite, contracciones, contracciones, contracciones. <laughs> there you go. You are going to be extremely happy to learn contractions in Spanish. And let me tell you why. Um, first, if your language, if your mother language is English, um, you have so many contractions in English, okay? Instead, instead of saying, I do not, you say, I don't. That's a contraction. Instead of saying the whole two words, you fuse these two into one. You just say, I don't. You are saving time and you're saving energy, okay? It's all about the economy of the language. That's why contractions occur. Um, and because English is such a practical language, <laughs> uh, you have heaps of contractions to be learned, right? Same thing if your language, if your first language is Italian, or maybe you are also learning Italian alongside with Spanish. Uh, I'm not sure, I haven't learned Italian myself, but I heard that they have about like 12 or 16 contractions, okay? Um, but in Spanish, good news, amigos, muy buenas noticias. We only have two. Yes, only two. Okay, so these two contractions are only happening with two prepositions, dos preposiciones en español. La primera preposición, the first preposition that is going to have this contraction is la preposición a. It's with the preposition a, okay? Um, this preposition will have different translations depending on the context, of course, uh, but usually it's translated as, um, as direction to, uh, for, uh, you know, it, it really has many translations. Uh, there are other videos where we explain uh, the different meanings of the preposition. I definitely go back to those. Today I'm just focusing in the um, contractions um, and not quite on the meaning of each of these prepositions, okay? Uh, just briefly, I want you to remember that I usually is translated as two, okay? Um, la, otra prepo eh, la, 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 la otra preposición que tiene una contracción en español es la preposición de. Another preposition that has a contraction in Spanish is the preposition de, which usually means, depending on the context of, um, like, the preposition of, uh, yeah, the preposition of. <laughs> And of course, many other meanings. Uh, definitely go back to other videos where we explain this as well. Okay, so how this contraction works in Spanish. Basically, when either of these two prepositions meets with the um, article, the, the, the male or masculine singular article, el, which in English is going to be translated as the, when you have the preposition a plus El, okay, I have a little chart for you here. I hope you can see this clearly. Um, so basically what's going to happen is that if you have the preposition a plus el, it becomes al, okay? Please repeat, al, al, al. Very good. But if you have the preposition de followed by el, so in Spanish it sounds a little bit weird if you say de el, de el, okay? 
uh, even now that I'm saying it, I feel that I'm sounding retarded. So <laughs> what we do is we contract these two. The L becomes del. 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 So that's it. Those are the only two contractions we have in Spanish. Let's practice, okay? Because if we don't practice, we forget what we just learned. Please complete the following phrases with the Spanish contractions. Bolivia y Paraguay están al norte de Argentina. El agua del mar es salada. ¿Vamos al cine? Vengo del doctor. Okay. So the contractions that we just learned are the official contractions of, of Spanish. What I'm trying to say is that they're widely spread in our language, okay? Uh, people say uh, those contractions and, and they're grammatically correct in Spain, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Paraguay, in any country uh, where we speak Spanish, okay? We are going to be using these con con uh, contractions, uh, okay? They are formal. They, they are formally accepted in our language. But we have more contractions <laughs> that are not widely spread, meaning that some regions will be using these contractions and they are quite known by other people, but it doesn't mean that we all use it and they're not accepted as such. In informal situations, for example, you wouldn't use these contractions, okay? So the first one I want to show you is the contraction of the, another preposition, which is the preposition para, okay? So instead of saying the whole word, instead of saying para, we get rid of the ra, okay? Instead of saying para arriba, we say para arriba. Instead of saying para qué, we are gonna say pa qué. Repite, por favor. Para arriba. Pa qué. Para arriba. Pa qué. They're really informal, okay? So do not use these ones. If you're talking to an elderly person, if you're talking to, I don't know, someone that it's in a hierarchy higher than yourself, okay? Please don't use these ones. Another one that I found adorable in Spanish, I absolutely love it. I don't use it myself, but I, when I hear other people using this one in Spanish, I just love it. And it's when they drop the D between vowels, okay? Uh, for example, um, some dialects of Cuba, instead of saying pescado, which means fish, right? Uh, they will say pescado. <laughs> Repeat it. Pescado. Pescado. Another one is that when they're using the, the participle, uh, they will... They will drop the D as well. I've, I've heard this quite a lot in Spain, for example, um, in Barcelona, I think. And this is, uh, for example, instead of saying, um, has comprado, have you bought the car? Has comprado el auto? They will say, has comprado el auto? <laughs> Which is very cute. Uh, please repeat. Has comprado? Has Comprao. And another one that we use quite a lot is with the verb estar, 
okay? So instead of saying está, the whole thing, we just say ta. <laughs> uh, again, this is very informal, so please make sure you only use it uh, in very informal situations with people that you feel very comfortable with. Um, so, for example, instead of saying está bien or está mal, you're going to say está bien, está bien, está mal, está mal. Okay, amigos, muchas gracias por ver este video. Today I had a lot of fun making this video. I hope that you enjoy it yourself as well. Um, again, muchísimas gracias for watching and I will see you next time. Nos vemos. Adios. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. So... ¿Por qué is a connector or a conjunción in the Spanish language that, that helps express the cause of something, that shows the cause of something? So, for example, in the, in the sentence, a Teresa le gusta el bosque porque hay muchos árboles, that would mean Teresa likes the park because there are a lot of trees. In this case, porque is the cause. Because you can you can translate it as, as that. Uh, now, sometimes these connectors could go at the beginning of the sentence. So I could also say, porque hay muchos árboles, a Teresa le gusta el bosque. Now, we'll, we will give you some alternatives of this word. The first one is debido a. Yo no pude ir al concierto debido a que se acabaron los boletos. Second one is dado que Margarita canta muy bien. Dado que ella ha ido a clases de canto desde pequeña. The third one is ya que no he ido al gimnasio esta semana ya que me dio flojera. Exactly. Now, number four is a causa de. And I can use this with a noun. So, for example, hoy no podemos salir a causa de la lluvia. Now, you can also say hoy no podemos salir porque está lloviendo and in this case we're using the verb so a causa de works with the nouns so in the previous four alternatives we can use the connector the conjunción either before the main clause or after the main clause so remember that the connector is the one that we use to show the cause of something but now we have other two alternatives but these alternatives work differently so pay close attention to this so the first one is como and como only could go before the main clause so it goes in the first position for example um, como no tengo dinero no podré salir de vacaciones Ok, the second one in this case is pues. Diego, tenemos que terminar el video rápido, pues la cámara tiene poca pila. In this case, uh, pues needs to be after the main clause. Now, we will give you three sentences, and your task is to change the word por qué to an alternative that we already gave you before. The first one is... Está sonando mucho mi estómago porque tengo hambre. Some possible answers. Está sonando mucho mi estómago ya que tengo hambre. Está sonando mucho mi estómago a causa de mi hambre. The second one is... Hoy no quiero ir al cine porque... No hay buenas películas. Some possible answers. Como no hay buenas películas, 
no quiero ir al cine. No quiero ir al cine debido a que no hay buenas películas. Number three. Me duele mucho la cabeza porque anoche me desvelé. Son possible answers. Me duele la cabeza pues anoche me desvelé. Me duele la cabeza ya que ayer me desvelé. That's it for today, my beautiful friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed the video. If so, please give it your thumbs up because we love it. And share with other learners. Also, if you have any comment or opinion, please let us know in the comment section. We do read them. So, see you in our next video. Hello there, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. <laughs> my name is Diego. And I'm Efrain. Hey, Efrain, did you know that there are so many ways to express fear in Spanish? Oh, for real? Um, yeah, we have uh, susto, temor, pánico, dar miedo, tener miedo, and so on. We have so many ways. So, in this video, we're going to show you the most common ways for expressing fear in Spanish. So, enjoy, enjoy it! it! So let's start with fear. Keep in mind that in Spanish you have or you give fear. So you don't scare, you give fear. And you're not afraid, you have fear. And um, let's break down the word fear. And the first one we have is temer. Exactly. So temer is the word that you use for a specific fear. Uh, kind of a haunting and deep-seated feeling uh, so for example you may use it in a situation like temo que este video no tenga muchas vistas uh, and that's the same as mi temor es que este video no tenga muchas vistas You can also use temer in kind of a formal situation and it works the same as in English the word fear or I'm afraid that. So for example, eh, temo, ma, ma, imagine this, my girlfriend doesn't want to speak with me anymore because I'm afraid that I said something bad to her. So in this situation I will say, temo que le haya dicho algo malo a mi novia. Miedo, meanwhile, is a common sort of fear. So you have these fears of heights, of spiders, of the dark, and public speaking, and so on. Um, in Spanish, you would say, me dan miedo, or tengo miedo de ellos. Uh, remember that these things give you fear. For example, me da miedo, Uh, me da me dan miedo las arañas me dan miedo los escorpiones y tengo miedo de la oscuridad and this and this is miedo yeah, exactly exactly so now the next word is asustar and that's basically what I just did so the the word asustar we we could say that it is a sudden fear. And for that we have the verb asustar or even dar susto or the noun, just susto. Now keep in mind something. In English you will translate this as to scare. But in English, remember that scare is also a deep-seated feeling. So you will say in English, spiders scare me. But in, in, in Spanish it will be more like Tengo miedo de las arañas o me dan miedo las arañas. You will only use asustar o dar susto or susto in this. A shock, in a sudden fear. Que susto me diste. Lo siento. <laughs> Next word is espantar. Espantar is pretty similar to asustar. But it has a little bit difference. Espantar works, for, works better for to scare away. For example, in Spanish we have the word espantapájaros, which literally means 
to scare away birds. And be careful, we also have the word espantoso, and it doesn't mean uh, scary, it rather means um, dreadful. Exactly, so don't confuse. Dreadful is espantoso, not scary. So you might ask yourself, so how should I convey scary? So the thing is that in Spanish we don't have a word, a specific word for scary, but we, uh, you, you, can, you can say instead de miedo o que da miedo. So for example, if you want to say that's a scary situation, uh, you would say es una situación de miedo o es una situación que da miedo. Now another note, don't say miedoso because miedoso is not scary. Miedoso is actually someone who is a coward. So no seas miedoso. Don't be a coward, basically. Mi novia me lo dice todo el tiempo. <laughs> <laughs> Ahora te vamos a dar más palabras con las que puedes expresar miedo. Y así puedes expandir aún más tu vocabulario. La primer palabra es tétrico. Esta palabra se puede traducir al inglés como eerie y puede ser perfecta para describir una calle sola a mitad de la noche, también una casa abandonada o una foto de un cadáver. La siguiente es aterrador. Se puede traducir como algo que es scary, pero va aún más allá, scarier. Y la puedes usar para describir uh, una película que te dio mucho miedo, por ejemplo, El Conjuro, la película En Conjuro es aterradora. Realmente. Ok, también tenemos las palabras pavor y pánico, las podemos utilizar en una expresión como me da pavor o me da pánico y eso se utiliza para un tipo de miedo fóbico y también con odio. Por ejemplo, a mí me dan pavor los insectos y también a mí me dan pánico los insectos. Finalmente tenemos la palabra horror y cosa. También los podemos utilizar de forma similar. Entonces podemos decir me da horror o me da cosa y esto en inglés es como it, it, it disgusts me, uh, por ejemplo, mm, ese señor me da horror, ese señor me da cosa, it disgusts me. That's it for today my beautiful friends from SpanishPod101.com We hope that you have enjoyed the video, if so please give us your thumbs up and share with other learners. And nos vemos en el siguiente video. Hey there, friends from SpanishPod101.com. Once again, I'm Efraín. And I'm Diego. And do you know that many of the, the, of the words that we use in Spanish come from Nahuatl? Even in English, you have some words. So we're going to talk about it in this video. Exactly. So enjoy it. Nahuatl is the Aztec language. Some people even call it Mexicano, but it is one of the most widespread indigenous languages of Mexico. Uh, nowadays, it is, it is still spoken throughout the country. Exactly. Many people that come to visit Mexico don't realize but many of the words that we use come from the Nahuatl language and even the English language have adopted some of these words. Now in this video we're going to show you 15 of the most common words that you can use in a daily basis. So let's get started! The first word we have is apapachar and it comes from the Nahuatl apapachua which means to soften up something with the fingers. In English you could say to pamper uh, one example we have is <sighs> Necesito que alguien me apapache Estoy muy triste <laughs> No Ok, 
So the next one is aguacate, which comes from the Nahuatl aguacatl. It originally means testicles, but of course nowadays it just means avocado. So let's see one example. Se me antoja un aguacate. Aquí tengo dos. <laughs> okay. Okay, the, the third uh, word is chicle. It comes from the Nahuatl chicle. Um, and it is a natural bubble gum that comes from, the, from a tree, which is called zapopote. One example is quiero un chicle. Okay, that's an example. <laughs> okay, the next one is <laughs> chile, which comes from the Nahuatl chili, and it means just a uh, hot pepper. So, for example, in Mexico, mucha comida tiene chile. The next word we have is chipotle, and it comes from the combination between uh, chili and potli. Potli literally means smoke. So as a translation of chipotle, we have smoked um, hot pepper. <laughs> smoked hot pepper. One example we have is, ay, no sabes cómo se me antojan unas buenas quesadillas ahí con su salsa de chipotle. Mm, al tiro, papá. Okay, so the next one is chocolate, which of course you know what is that. It comes from the Nahuatl chocolate. So, of course, you don't need an English translation for this. As an example, a mí me encanta el chocolate blanco. Hmm. A mí este. <laughs> well, okay. Um, the next one is um, coyote. And it comes from the Nahuatl coyote. Simple, right? And it came to the English uh, in the middle of. 1700 around that age came the word to the english for example ya leíste la historia del coyote en la luna no ah pues no no yo tampoco creo la acabo de inventar okay the next word is cuate and cuate comes from the nahuatl cuatl originally it means a twin but nowadays in Mexico, we refer when we say cuate to a close friend. So for example, Efraín es mi cuate. Cuatl. Mi cuatl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have the word elote, which comes from the Nahuatl elotl. And it means the ear of the corn. Elote in English is corn. One example is Diego, ¿tú has visto este reto en internet del elote? Que se lo comen con un talado. Está padre, ¿no? No lo he visto, pero supongo que sí. Pues ahí está, ahí lo ves luego. Ok. The next one is guacamole, which comes from the Nahuatl aguacamole. And it is at the same time formed by two words. Aguacatl, which we covered before, aguacate, and mole, which means sauce. So, for example, a mí me gustan los nachos con guacamole. Mmm, muy ricos. Ricos. Next word is mezcal, and it comes from the Nahuatl mezcali. It is also formed by two words. The first one is metal, which is agave, and the second one is escali, which is boiled. And it is a nice drink from Mexico, and if you come, you should try it. Of For course. example, Ah, Diego, ¿cómo me dan ganas de echarme un mezcal? De esos con el gusanito ahí dentro. Mm. Pues ahorita que terminemos el video nos lo echamos. Voy a invitar a mi novia a tomarlo. Ok. Sí. Perfecto. Ok, so, the next word is popote. And this is a very Mexican word. It comes from the Nahuatl popotli. And it is originally a dry stem from a particular tree that is, uh, from a particular plant that is grown here in Mexico. So, a popote is basically a straw. So, for example, no uses popotes. Son malos para el medio ambiente. Okay, gracias. Next word is tianguis, and it comes from the Nahuatl tibanquiscli, which means market. Tianguis, in English, is a street market. 
As an example, we could say, ¿sabes qué, Diego? Me dan ganas de comprarme más ropa en el tianguis, porque es barata, es económica y no gastas mucho dinero. Ajá, ese es mi punto. <risa> ok, uh, o sea, es muy barato. Es barato. <risa> es muy barato. <risa> the next one is Tlapalería, and it comes from the Nahuatl Tlapali, which actually means color. So, nowadays a trapaleria is a hardware store where you can find paint and other tools. So, for example, yo compro mi pintura y mis herramientas en la trapaleria. Oh, genial. The next one and the last one is tomate. And it comes from the Nahuatl tomato. As you know, tomate means agua gorda. Which... In, tra in direct translation is fat water. <laughs> tomate in English is tomato. For example, ¿alguna vez le has dado una mordida a un tomate? Sí. ¿Qué rayos? ¿Sí? Sí. ¿Qué les pasa? Es muy rico. Okay. That's it for today, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give us your thumbs up because we love to see them. And also, if you have any opinion, any comment, let us know in the comment section. Nos vemos en el siguiente video. Hasta luego. Hello there, friends from SpanishPod101.com. My name is Diego. And I'm Efrain! <laughs> and today we're gonna check refranes which can be translated as saying. But, um, refranes is much more than that because it includes cultural and education from Mexico. Exactly, so in this video we're going to check 10 very popular refranes that you should know. So, enjoy this video! <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what is a refrain? A refrain basically is a short and pity expression that contains uh, wisdom. But some refranes also teach a moral lesson. Okay, the first refrain is al buen entendedor pocas palabras. Lo cual puede significar que a alguien inteligente no se le necesita dar muchas explicaciones. Y puede ser traducido al inglés como A word to the wise is enough. El segundo refrán es Más sabe el diablo por viejo que por diablo. Y aquí podemos nosotros eh, entender que la experiencia y el conocimiento vienen a través de lo que los años aportan. Y puede ser eh, traducido al inglés como The experience is the best teacher. So, the third one is Árbol que crece torcido jamás su tronco endereza. Y esta frase quiere decir que una persona no podrá cambiar su forma de pensar o de actuar si no ha sido formado o enseñado desde pequeño. Una traducción en inglés puede ser As the twig is bent, so the tree grows. Ok, the next refrain is Crea fama y échate a dormir. Lo cual significa que una vez que tú tienes cierta reputación, esta reputación te va a anteceder y costará tiempo y esfuerzo cambiarla. En inglés se puede traducir o hay un refrán o hay un saying similar a este, el cual es Give the dog a bad name and hand him. Sí, el siguiente es, dime de qué presumes y te diré de qué careces. Y esto habla de una persona que expone mucho sus virtudes, su conocimiento, sus logros y en una forma los presume. Eh, pero justamente son estos conocimientos, virtudes y triunfos los que no tiene, entonces es una proyección de esa persona. En inglés podemos tener una traducción como eh, Tell me what you know and I will tell you what you don't. Ok, and the next refrán is um, El que es perico donde quiera es verde. Y esto significa que las virtudes que una persona tiene 
puede brillar en cualquier lugar y en cualquier momento, no importa dónde sea, no importa en qué momento sea. Una traducción de esto al inglés podría ser, you are who you are, no matter where you are. Yeah. El siguiente refrán es muy especial para mí, porque mi mamá me lo solía decir, el que anda con lobos, aullar se enseña. Y esto significa que los usos, costumbres y educación que unas personas tienen son adquiridas por alguien que se junta con esas personas. O sea que si una persona acostumbra a beber en las noches y tú te juntas con esa persona, tú podrías adquirir esa costumbre. Bueno, eso es lo que mi mamá me decía. En inglés esto puede ser traducido como Who lies with dogs has fleas. Bien, so the next refrán is sale más caro el caldo que las albóndigas y esta expresión alude a las situaciones en las que los medios que utilizamos para obtener algo son más costosos que el beneficio de eso. So for example, imagine that you recently buy a used car uh, but it has so many problems and you need to fix the car constantly. So at the end, the, the cost is the same as if you had bought a new car, a brand new car. So in this sense, a uh, translation could be, the fix is worse than the problem. Okay, el siguiente refrán es, agua que no has de beber, déjala correr. Y esto es algo que significa que si tú no estás seguro con algo o con alguien, no lo tomes o no te aferres a eso y aplica mucho en la vida amorosa, si tú no estás seguro de tener algo con alguien, simplemente déjalo ir para que alguien más lo aproveche. The, the translation of, of, of this is when in, when in doubt, throw it out, ok? So, la última expresión, el último refrán es a darle que es mole de olla. Um, y esto es una invitación a hacer algo con mucho ánimo, eh, sin demora en este momento. So, for example, if you are with your friend Jose and you are about to eat some tacos, you can say to Jose, hey, Jose, a darle que es mole de olla. So, in this sense, it could be more like, uh, let's do this. So that's it for today, friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed the video. If so, please give us your thumbs up and share with other learners. See you please. in the upcoming video. And comment it. Hi everyone on SpanishPod101.com. I'm Efraín. And I'm Diego. And today we're going to talk about special usages of the verb tener. You already know the meaning, but do you already know the usages? You may not. So, enjoy, enjoy the video. So, as you know, the verb tener essentially means to have, but it can also be translated as to possess or to hold or even to contain. However, why does the expression tengo ganas de ir al baño means I want to go to the bathroom, whereas tengo hambre means I'm hungry. As you can notice here, the verb tener is not as easy as you previously thought. Tener is a very common word and it is used in a lot of expressions. Some of them make sense, but some other times, uh, not that much. Yeah, so now let's take a look into the most common usages of this verb. So the first expression is tener un buen día and this expression is used when you say good, goodbye to someone and you wish that someone a nice day. Um, normally we will say que tenga un buen día as in the formal version or que tengas un buen día as in the to or informal version. So for example. Diego ya me tengo que ir. Uh, tengo que ir a comerme estos panes, mi hermana me invitó a tomar un café y comer de estos panes, uh, no sé de qué están hechos, son verdes pero están deliciosos. Ok, bueno que tengas un buen día. Gracias. 
The second, the second expression is tener que. A need is used to express a, a necessity or an imperative. Or simply that something must be done. Tener que. To have to. For example, Diego, tienes que acabar de leer este video. <risa> Diego, tienes que acabar de leer este libro. ¿Por qué? ¿Tú ya lo leíste? No, pero tiene dibujos bien chidos. <risa> the next common use of the verb tener is that we can translate this verb as the verb to be. What? Yes, that's right. Sometimes the verb tener means to be. For example, in tengo hambre, I am hungry. Tengo sed, I am thirsty. Tengo sueño, I am sleepy. Tengo razón, I am right. Tengo prisa, I am in a hurry. And so on. The next one or the next expression is to express the age. Contrary to English, we don't use the verb to be to express the age. We, do, we rather use the verb tener. For example, uh, Diego, ¿cuántos años tiene tu novia? Yo no tengo novia. Ah, ¿no? ¿Y qué me dices de la que... de la... o de... Bueno, eh, uh, bueno, eh, de, ca cambiemos de tema. Mi, eh, no, mi novia tiene 20 años. Ah, ah, ok. ¿Y, ¿Y tú cuántos años tienes? Eso es un secreto. <risa> Finally, we will give you a set of expressions that you may use on a daily basis. For this, we will give you four expressions. Number one. Tener lugar, to take place. For example, Efraín, el concierto de Depeche Mode tendrá lugar en el Foro Sol en la Ciudad de México. Wow, genial. Ok, the second one. Tener los nervios de punta, to be on edge. Mm -hmm. For example, Efraín, ¿ya te dieron los resultados del examen de la ingreso a la maestría? Ni me lo menciones, Diego. Tengo los nervios de punta. Mañana me dan los resultados. Tranquilo, todo va a estar muy bien. Todo va a estar muy bien. Eso espero. Ok, the next one is tener ganas de. It means to feel like. And it is very simple. For example, tengo ganas de comer unos taquitos. Tengo ganas de jugar Monopoly. Very straightforward. Ok, the last one is tener que ver con. To have to do with. And, for example, Diego, yo iba caminando con mi amiga Sofía el otro día. Oye, a todo esto, ¿cómo está tu hermano? Muy bien, gracias. Sí, ¿por qué? Um, o sea, yo iba caminando con Sofía el otro día y, y, y es una chica muy bonita. Sí, es muy guapa. Muy, eh, muy guapa. Ah, ojalá y se me haga con ella, de verdad. <risa> Vamos a esperar que sí. Bueno, pero ¿qué tiene que ver mi hermano con todo esto? Mm, nada, solo me acordé de él y quería saber cómo está. Ah, ok. That's it for today, my <laughs> friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give us your thumbs up and share it with other learners. Also, we want you to know that we do read your comments and also reply to them. So, please feel free to pause them. Thank you guys for all your support and for let us know that we are handsome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, see you in the next video. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hola, bienvenidos. Hello and welcome. Mi nombre es Romina. My name is Romina. Mucho gusto. Nice to meet you. Hoy voy a explicarte tres estructuras gramaticales para dar sugerencias o recomendaciones con la palabra mejor. 
Today I'm going to teach you three grammatical structures to give other people advice uh, or suggestions or recommendations with the word mejor. ¿Qué significa mejor? So what does mejor means in Spanish? Mejor can be translated as best or better, dependiendo del contexto. So depending on the context, it can be translated as one word or the other. Bien, así es como vamos a hacerlo. Primero voy a explicarte las frases. Okay. Voy a pedirte que repitas después de mí varias veces, así practicas la pronunciación y al final del video vamos a hacer ejercicios para que tú practiques las nuevas estructuras. So this is the way we're going to do it. Um, first, I'm going to explain you the structures. Okay. I'm going to ask you to repeat a few times so you get the hand of the pronunciation. And at the end of the video, I'm going to ask you to complete a few exercises so you can practice at home. ¿Estás listo? ¡Vamos! Are you ready? Let's go. Número uno. ¿Por qué no mejor más presente del indicativo? Please repeat. ¿Por qué no mejor más presente del indicativo? Por favor, repite. ¿Por qué no mejor? ¿Por qué? ¿Qué no mejor? ¿Por qué no mejor? ¿Por qué no mejor? Ok, so after this, you have to use the present, uh, the verbs in the present tense of the indicative form. Okay, so the way you use this phrase in Spanish is in situations when someone is telling you their issue, they're, they're talking to you about a problem they're having, and they're thinking about a solution, um, but you don't consider this solution good enough, and you're, you're thinking of giving them another option, okay? The rules are that one instead, okay? So it's, it's almost like if you are saying like, why don't you do this instead, okay? Or it would be better if you did this other thing, okay? That's, that's what you're saying with this phrase. ¿Por qué no mejor, okay? Um, so you're ruling out a different idea, a previous idea, okay? Uh, let's say, for example, your friend is having issues at work and uh, this person feels overwhelmed and it's uh, he's or she is saying that uh, they want to quit their job and you think this is a bit dramatic, a bit drastic and maybe just um, talking to the manager will fix the issue, right? So you're going to say in Spanish, ¿Por qué no mejor hablas con tu jefe? Please repeat. ¿Por qué no mejor hablas con tu jefe? Muy bien. Número dos. Ok, so the second structure I'm going to show you now has two options. You can choose whichever you like. Uh, the first one is, ¿Será mejor que? And then the other option is, Va a ser mejor que. Ok, eh, please repeat. Será mejor que. Será mejor que. Será mejor que. Va a ser mejor que. Va a ser mejor que. Va a ser mejor que. Okay, so what's the difference? It's basically um, the verb ser, um, we are using this in the future tense, okay? We are basically saying in Spanish with these two options, they, they mean exactly the same thing. So what we are saying in, in Spanish is, it will be best. It will be best. So we are talking in the future tense, okay? Um, 
in Spanish, as you know, we have two options for the future tense, right? Uh, so the first one is uh, the simple future, será, so that's the conjugation of the verb ser, to be, in the future, in the simple future, será. Or we can use a structure with the verb ir, a, e, va, a, ser, right? Um, so you just need to use va, a, ser. And that's also the future, right? It's gonna be, it's, it's gonna mean it will be. You might be wondering which option should I use? Which one um, is more frequent than the other one? Or are there certain countries that would, or nationalities that would, would prefer to use one or the other? And the thing is that not, not really, they're both <laughs> equally the same. So another thing to keep in mind with this phrase is that you're going to be using the verbs in the present tense of the subjunctive, subjunctivo, okay? So make sure you revise the sub subjunctivo. Going back to a previous example, okay, um, this time I'm going to say, Será mejor que hables con tu jefe. Va a ser mejor que hables con tu jefe. Repite, por favor. Será mejor que hables con tu jefe. Va a ser mejor que hables con tu jefe. So, again, here we can be using this phrase as an alternative to something else. Like, you're, you're just giving them a suggestion. Like, I think it would be best if you... Uh, talk to your boss instead of quitting your job. Uh, so you, you will, you're saying it will be best, right? But you don't necessarily need to wait for them to uh, say a suggestion or, or, a, or a solution that they, they're thinking of. You don't have to wait until they do that to use this phrase. Uh, we actually use it all the time without necessarily cancelling a previous idea. Numero tres. The last structure I'm going to teach you is pretty straightforward. It's just the word mejor plus the verbs in the imperative form. So make sure you practice the verb conjugation in the imperative form. Um, so it's very, it's very easy. It's just that mejor más imperativo. You're going to say mejor habla con tu jefe. And if you want to make this idea negative, you just have to make it, uh, you just need to conjugate the verbs in the negative form of the imperative. Mejor no hables con tu jefe. Vamos a practicar, let's practice. Please repeat after me. Mejor habla con tu jefe. Mejor habla con tu jefe. Mejor no hables con tu jefe. Mejor no hables con tu jefe. Now I would like for you to give suggestions or recommendations with the three structures that you just learned um, to these uh, four issues. Um, try to say as many phrases as you can. Tengo problemas para dormir. Quiero perder peso. Me gustaría aprender mandarín. Me gustaría estar de novia. Okay, amigos, those are the three structures I wanted to teach you with the word mejor. I hope that you understand everything, that you understand how to use these structures. I definitely recommend you to go back a few times in the video, practice these uh, phrases as much as you can, 
and definitely it's very important for you to practice the conjugations of the verbs in Spanish for the present tense in the indicative form, uh, for the present tense in the subjunctive form, and of course the imperative. Muchas gracias, thank you so much as usual for watching this video, and we will see you in the next time. Nos vemos en la próxima clase. Adiós. Soy Brenda Romaniello, tu profesora de español. Hello, I'm Brenda Romaniello, your Spanish teacher. Hoy vamos a ver el verbo poder en español. Today we're going to have a look at the verbo poder, which means can or be able to in English. We're going to use el verbo poder en español to talk about skills and abilities, so basically things that you can do. So before we start talking about skills and abilities that you may have and how to use them in Spanish, uh, let's have a look at the conjugation of this verb. El verbo poder is um, a, an irregular verb in the present tense in Spanish and as you can see the ending of the verb is er. So remember we have three different endings for infinitive verbs in Spanish. Verbs that end in ar, verbs that end in er and verbs that end in ir. In the case of poder, it belongs to the second category of uh, infinitive verbs in Spanish because it ends in er. So what does that mean? Why is that important? Because when we conjugate it, that is when we put the verb in, um, in agreement with the person performing the action, we're going to change that ending depending on the person that is performing the action. There is a specific ending for the verbs uh, that end in er, uh, which will, I'll show you in this uh, specific lesson uh, that you can use basically for all the other regular verbs in Spanish in the present tense. But we say that el verbo poder en español is actually an, an irregular verb, which means that something is going to change. Lucky for us is not the ending that's going to change when, when we conjugate this verb, but rather the stem of the verb, so the pod part. When we conjugate this verb in Spanish, we're going to change the O for UE. Now, be careful. Nosotros and vosotros, they never or generally, they never change when we uh, conjugate them in the present tense. So in that case, it's going to, to keep the stem just as any re regular verb. Let's conjugate then this verb in the present tense in Spanish. Poder. Yo puedo. Tú puedes. Él, ella puede. Nosotros, nosotras podemos. Vosotros, vosotras podéis. Ustedes pueden. Ellos, ellas pueden. Fantástico! Now that we have conjugated this verb and we know how to uh, put it in a sentence with a person performing the action, let's talk about some skills and abilities in Spanish. So we can use this verb to talk about all the amazing things that we can do in Spanish. Por ejemplo, we can talk about sports abilities. You can say Puedo nadar, puedo esquiar, puedo bailar salsa, puedo correr cinco kilómetros. No es nada, cinco kilómetros. No much. I'm not much of a runner, obviously. The only thing I can run to is the bus. I, 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 it feels like five k's. Puedo correr una maratón. Other skills could be speaking a language or being able to draw or play an instrument. Por ejemplo, puedo hablar español. Puedo hablar francés. Puedo hablar ruso. Puedo dibujar. Puedo pintar. Puedo tejer. Puedo tocar la guitarra. Puedo tocar el violín. Puedo tocar el piano. We can also talk about um, general skills or information abilities. Por ejemplo, puedo hablar de economía y política. And some general skills. Puedo cocinar muy bien. Por ejemplo, puedo cocinar lasañas. Puedo cocinar paellas. Puedo cocinar auténticos tacos mexicanos. So as you can see, to talk about all these skills, we are using el verbo poder and then the ability, which could also be another verb. 
Be careful, when we have two verbs together, we only conjugate the first. So you can see here that I say, puedo nadar. It's incorrect to say, puedo nado. In this case, we don't need to say nado, we need the verb in the infinitive form, nadar. Puedo nadar. If you say, nado, that means I swim. So there you're conjugating that verb to say something different. So you, you also, of course, are talking about skills because you say nado, I swim. But in this particular case, when you use it with the verb poder, you're talking about a specific skill. You want to say that you have that skill. Puedo nadar. I am able to swim. I can swim. So that's why you have to leave the second verb in the infinitive form. So, if you want to say that you cannot do these things, or if you don't have the ability to do certain things, you can do it in a very simple way. All we have to do is put a NO before the verb to basically talk about things that we cannot do or are not able to do. Por ejemplo, No puedo nadar. No puedo esquiar. No puedo bailar tango. No puedo cocinar nada. No puedo conducir. And now uh, we can also use this verb to establish a, a basic conversation in Spanish because it's really interesting when you want to get to know people better. If you talk about things that you can or cannot do and then compare and contrast, you can ask them, they answer, then you can, they can uh, ask you back and then you can also reply pretty much using the same structure. So let's have a look at how to ask people what abilities they have or what skills they have or what can they do. We're going to use uh, the verb in the second person singular uh, tú, right? So we're going to say puedes. For example, if we want to ask can you swim? We're going to say puedes nadar. And remember, we have the question marks uh, at the beginning and at the end to establish that that's a question. And then we, we do it in the oral form with the intonation. Puedes nadar. Can you swim? Puedes cocinar lasaña. Can you cook lasaña? Puedes hablar ruso? Can you speak Russian? And for the answer is very simple. To answer to these questions in an affirmative way, we would say, Sí, puedo nadar. Then you can ask, ¿Y tú? There you have the beautiful conversation. ¿Puedes nadar? Sí, puedo nadar. ¿Y tú? To answer this question in a negative form, you can say, No, no puedo nadar. ¿Y tú? What about you? So pay attention that here we have two no's. The first no is going to be answering no to the question, can you swim? No. And the second no that you see there is going to be uh, used to negate the verb. So, no puedo nadar, I cannot swim. There you have it. This is a great uh, piece of information that you can use uh, when you talk to your amigos in Spanish and ask and talk about different abilities and skills. It's a great way to get to know Spanish speakers better. I really hope that you understand this lesson and that you found this lesson helpful. Uh, give it a th thumbs up if you did and I will be very glad to see you next class. Nos vemos. Adios. Hola, soy Romina Romagnolo, tu profesora de español. Hi guys, my name is Romina Romagnolo. I'm your Spanish teacher. Y hoy voy a explicarte cómo utilizar la preposición en en español. So today I'm going to teach you how to use the preposition en en español in Spanish. During this video, you're going to realize that most of the time this a preposition can be translated into English as in in, at, or during. So just as in English, in, at, and during are talking about two things. We are either talking about time or we are talking about location. Veamos primero cómo utilizamos la preposición en para hablar de tiempo en español. So let's focus first in how we use the preposition en in Spanish to talk about time. I'll give you a couple examples. En el año 2003, Carolina se mudó a Madrid.
en el año 2003, Carolina se mudó a Madrid. En el año 2003, Carolina se mudó a Madrid. I'm sure you can guess the meaning of this uh, sentence. Uh, basically, we are just saying, in the year two 2003, Carolina moved to Madrid. So here, the preposition en is showing the time, exactly the year where this happened. En Pascuas, viaje a Chile. En Pascuas, viaje a Chile. So, in this example, again, I'm using the preposition en to talk about the time that I traveled to Chile. Uh, during Easter, so you can see that in this case, I'm not going to be translating the preposition en as in in, um, as in the previous example. Instead, I'm, I'm going to translate it as during. During Easter, I traveled to Chile. Chile. Um, I guess you can also use the preposition in in English, but I'm not too sure about that. I think it's okay if you say, I uh, travel to Chile in Easter. I think that, that that's uh, grammatically correct as well. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it really depends um, how you want to translate this phrase. En diciembre empecé la dieta. En diciembre empecé la dieta. So here you're using the preposition in, next, a, n, sorry, uh, followed by a, a, a month, okay? Um, so it's perfectly fine in Spanish to say en plus a month, okay? En enero, en febrero, en marzo. Um, so the example that we were do, uh, saying just now was um, I started the, the, my diet, I started a diet on X month. Um, just be mindful that this is not applicable for the days of the week, okay? You can say en lunes, en martes, okay? In those cases, you're not supposed to use the preposition en, you just say el lunes, el martes, okay? Just be aware of it. So when we're talking about time with the preposition en, um, we can also use it to talk about something that is going to happen um, in the future, not just in the past. In the, in the previous examples I was just giving you, I was talking about things that happened in the past, okay? A diet that I started a couple months ago or um, a country I traveled uh, to uh, last Easter, okay? Uh, but what about things that are going to be happening in the next, I don't know, five minutes, uh, in the next hour or so, what's, what's, how can we use the preposition en when talking about future events? En cinco minutos nos vamos al cine. En cinco minutos nos vamos al cine. So in this example, I'm just using the preposition N to tell you that in five minutes we are leaving to the cinema. We are, we are going to watch a movie in about five minutes. En dos años hablaré español con fluidez. En dos años hablaré español con fluidez. So here I'm saying in two years time I'm going to be speaking Spanish fluently. The preposition en when talking about time can also be used to mark the duration of an action. I'll give you an example. El boleto de estacionamiento se vence en media hora. El boleto de estacionamiento se vence en media hora. In this example, I'm saying that the parking ticket um, lasts on only for half an hour, okay? En media hora. So here I'm using the preposition en to uh, talk about the duration of a particular action. Okay, so that's how we use the preposition en to talk about time. Uh, let's now focus about location. So when it comes to location, we can be talking about geographical 
location, okay? We can be talking about, I don't know, cities, towns, or countries, or continents, whatever. Anything that is geographical, anything that is um, that it actually exists, right? Um, so let's say, for example, um, Buenos Aires está en Argentina. Buenos Aires está en Argentina. So here, la preposición en means in. Buenos Aires, uh, the capital city of Argentina, is in Argentina. María está de vacaciones en Colombia. María está de vacaciones en Colombia. So here we are saying that Maria is having a holiday in Colombia, is currently in a holiday in Colombia. So of course when we talk about location, it doesn't necessarily mean only uh, geographical uh, cities or, or, country, or countries. Uh, it can also mean just any place really. La cama está en la habitación. La cama está en la habitación. So here we are saying uh, the bed is in the bedroom. Okay? Me olvidé el paraguas en el carro. Me Olvidé el paraguas en el carro. So here we're saying I forgot the umbrella in the car. Um, so basically here we are talking uh, about the inside of the car. In this example that I just mentioned, we can replace in Spanish the preposition en by the preposition dentro, okay? Instead of saying en el carro, I can say dentro del carro. In this context, both eh, en and dentro mean eh, inside. Las flores están en la mesa. Las flores están en la mesa. So here we are saying that the flowers are on top of the table. In this case, we can also replace the preposition en by the preposition sobre. Las flores están sobre la mesa. Sobre and en, in this case, both mean on top of. Sometimes when we are talking about space, it's not necessary, uh, necessarily something that it's uh, an actual space, uh, it, it exists in reality. Uh, it can be a metaphorical one as well. Por ejemplo, tú estás en mi corazón. Tú estás en mi corazón. So here I'm saying you are in my heart, okay? You're not literally in my heart, otherwise I wouldn't be able to breathe and, and live right now. I would be probably dead. Um, but it, it just basically means that uh, I'm using the preposition en with the sense of location, but this location doesn't really exist. It's just metaphorical. Okay, so romantic. Qué romántico. <laughs> Muy bien, amigos. Así es como utilizamos la preposición en en español. So this is how we use the preposition en in Spanish. I really hope that you enjoyed today's lesson. And as usual, please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or if there is anything that you would like me to clarify. I'm gonna also ask you that if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to get notifications um, when, we receive, when we upload new videos. Muchas gracias again for watching this video. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in our next class. Nos vemos en la próxima clase. Adiós. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hello and welcome back, my friends, from SpanishPod101.com. As you know, my name is Manuel. 
And I'm Rodrigo. Ooh, yeah, of course we're kidding. My name is Diego. <laughs> and I'm Efraim. Good. And today we're going to start with our serious Mexican words that you should know. So let's get started. Uh -huh. Let's get started. <laughs> Okay guys, first of all we want to tell you that we tried to do this video three times. Something bad happened in our previous two. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you can watch that at the end of this video. Yeah. Okay. Now we are going to watch a sketch uh, with the words that we are going to work with today. See if you can understand them. Let's go! Hey, hermano. ¿Qué onda, carnal? ¿Cómo estás? Ah, no muy bien. ¿Por qué? ¿Qué tienes? Tuve una pelea con mis papás y... Ah, está muy cañona la situación. Hey, pero no te me achico, ¿vale? uh, Mira, hay un café cerca de la casa. ¿Por qué no vamos ahí y echamos el chat? Uh, sí, claro. Solo que tengo un bonche de cosas en mi cartera, pero ninguna de ellas es dinero. Ey, no te preocupes por eso, yo pago. Cámara, va. Oye, pero ¿en dónde estás ahora? Eh, estoy en el parque, donde siempre nos encontramos. Ah, perfecto, entonces voy para allá. Sí, claro, te espero. Ey, Efraín. Ey. <risa> ¿Ya listo? Sí, solamente, espera, es que estoy muy cucho para ese lugar Claro que no eh, Déjame irme a cambiar, será rápido Chale, no, 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 no. mejor vamos a quedarnos aquí y platiquemos uh, Pero me da cosa que mis papás me vean porque me salí sin permiso No, tranquilo mijo, no creo que pase eso ¿Seguro? Seguro Rayos, creo que es mi mamá Ya nos cayó el chahuisle ¡Ah! As you might have understood, one of the words that we use was achicopale. And achicopale is basically like a minor state of depression, something that is not too high or too low. For example, Diego, se murió mi perro. Firulais? Sí. Mira, no, no te me achicopales. Eh, después compramos otro perro y. Firulais número 2. No hay problema. ¿Qué? <laughs> ok, the second word here is cañón. And you use it to describe that is that something is difficult. For example, um, Diego, ayer hice mi examen de ingreso a la maestría. Mm, ¿Qué tal? Estaba bien cañón. Uh, creo que no entré. Claro que sí vas a pasar, por supuesto. Ok, so, the next word is carnal. And carnal is one of the ways to call your best, best friend. So, for example, I can say, Efraín no es mi amigo. <laughs> Él es mi carnal. Oh. Ok, the next one is bonche. And it works just for countable things. It means a lot. For example... Diego, tengo un bonche de cosas en mi cartera, pero ninguna de ellas es dinero. Good. Ok, guys. The next word is chal. And we normally use this word with the expression echar el chal. And echar el chal basically means to go with a friend to a cafeteria or to something healthy and have like a brief talk. So, for example, Efraín, hay un café muy cerca de aquí, ¿por qué no vamos y echamos el chal? Claro, vamos. The next word is cucho, and you will use it to describe something that it is in bad shape, or something that doesn't look good, or something that is not well done. For example, Diego, tienes que levantar tu cuarto. Está bien cucho. Bien 
sucio, bien to todo está desordenado, está bien cucho. Gracias, yo, yo también te quiero. Ok, the next one is cámara. And that's one of the ways for saying ok. So, por ejemplo, uh, Efraín, ¿por qué no vamos a la plaza a um, patinar sobre hielo? Ok, cámara. Bien, vamos. Ok, the next one is chale, which means uff. Just like that, uff. <laughs> For example, Diego, um, al llegar aquí a tu casa me di cuenta de que se me perdió la cartera. Chale. La, sí. Chale. Ok, the next one is chahuisle. And we will normally use this word in the expression ya nos cayó el chahuisle. So, um, you're going to use this when you know that something bad is going to happen. For example, when you see a policeman coming by and you are drinking alcohol in the street, that you know that that's forbidden, you know that something bad is going to happen because he's going to give you a ticket. So, in that case, you can say, oh, oh, ya me cayó el chahuisle. Yeah. Okay. The last word is mijo. And you will use it to call a friend or a neighbor or someone of your neighborhood. This word is commonly uh, along with, or is commonly used with kiobole, which means WhatsApp. For example, kiobole mijo. Kiobole mijo. <laughs> That's <laughs> example. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Now we're going to watch once again the sketch, but now this time with subtitles, so you can understand it better. Hey, hermano. ¿Qué onda, carnal? ¿Cómo estás? Ah, no muy bien. ¿Por qué? ¿Qué tienes? Tuve una pelea con mis papás y... Ah, está muy cañona la situación. Ey, pero... No te me chico, ¿vale? Uh, mira, hay un café cerca de la casa. ¿Por qué no vamos ahí y echamos el chat? Uh, sí, claro. Solo que tengo un bonche de cosas en mi cartera, pero ninguna de ellas es dinero. Ey, no te preocupes por eso, yo pago. Cámara, va. Oye, pero ¿en dónde estás ahora? Eh, estoy en el parque, donde siempre nos encontramos. Ah, perfecto, entonces voy para allá. Sí, claro, te espero. Ey, Efraín. Ey. <risa> ¿Ya listo? Sí, solamente, espera, es que estoy muy cucho para ese lugar Claro que no eh, Déjame irme a cambiar, será rápido Chale, no, 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 no. mejor vamos a quedarnos aquí y platiquemos uh, Pero me da cosa que mis papás me vean porque me salí sin permiso No, tranquilo mijo, no creo que pase eso ¿Seguro? Seguro Rayos, creo que es mi mamá Ya nos cayó el chahuisle ah. That's it for today. Thank you. And um, please give us your thumbs up if you like this video. Comment us. We will reply to your comments. And we love you people. Thank you for everything. Subscribe to this beautiful channel, SpanishPod101.com. See you! Hello, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. My name is Diego. I'm mine. Hey, what's up, my friends from SpanishPod101.com? My name is Diego. I'm not my friend. Ah, today we're going to start with that. Hey there, friends of SpanishPod101.com. Once again, I'm Efraín. And I'm Diego. And today we're going to talk about homophones. We're going to make it very fun for you and useful. So, let's go! Okay, the first set of words is bello. The first one is with a B, bello. And it means something nice looking or someone handsome or something cool. 
The second one is with a V, Vejo, and it means fuzz or body hair. For example, for this video, I grew my mustache for two days. So now I can say that yo tengo bello, yo tengo bello, y yo soy un hombre bello con mucho bello. Okay. The next set of words is vaya, vaya, and vaya. Mm. So the first one is with a B and a Y. And um, vaya is basically a fruit and could be translated as very, okay? Now, the second word is vaya with a V and double L, and that could be translated as fence. And we also have vaya with a V and Y, and it means, uh, it is a conjugation of the verb to go, ir, but it is also an expression for saying wow. So, for example, a mí me gustan comer las vallas que están detrás de la valla de mi vecino. Vaya. <laughs> okay, the next set of words is casa. And the first one, casa, with an S, uh, it means house. Okay. <laughs> and the second one, with a seat, means, well, it, it is the noun, it is a noun hunting. The noun hunting. Yeah, yeah. the noun hunting. <laughs> okay, for example, vamos a la casa de mujeres. Sí, <laughs> vamos. Pero, pero, primero vamos a mi casa, porque necesito dinero. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the next set of words is hola and hola. So, of course, the first one is a greeting and it is hi, right? Like, hola. And the second one it is the hola, the, the waves. For example, you know, like in the ocean or in the sea. Um, for example, hola. Hola. ¿Te gustan las olas? <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't come up with another example. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, the next, <laughs> the next couple of words is cien. The first one with a C, cien, means one hundred. And the second, cien with an S, means a part of the head. Yeah, for example, Diego, te doy cien pesos si vas y le pegas a Rodolfo en la cien. Va. Vaya, genial. The next set of words is tubo and tubo. Tubo with a B means tube or pipe. And tubo with a V means is the, is the past tense of the verb tener in the third person. El tubo, ella tubo, usted tubo. For example. Diego, tengo que ir al baño. Claro. Oh, espera, pero el baño tuvo un accidente. ¿Qué pasó? El tubo de lavamanos se rompió. Ah, yo ni siquiera me lavo las manos. ¡Qué cochino! Oh, yeah. The next couple of words is basta. The first one, basta, with a V. Basta. And it means uh, extensive, huge, or vast. The second one, with V, basta, is used for... is a noun. Yeah. For example, Diego, te he contado de mi vasta experiencia como actor. Ya basta de decirme eso, no es cierto. Ok, the last set of words is rehusar and rehusar. Rehusar with an H means to deny or to refuse. And rehusar without the H is to use again. Uh, for example, me rehuso a rehusar esta playera para otro video. Ya lo sé tres veces. First, let's watch a brief talk and try to fill in the blanks the missing word. Hola Diego. Hey Efraín, ¿cómo estás? Tengo algo que contarte. Um, ayer me salté la valla de mi vecino. 
¿Qué? ¿Qué? ¿Por qué hiciste eso? Aposté con Carlos 100 pesos a que iba y me robaba una de sus vallas. Y vaya que no me iba a rehusar. Ahora entiendo, por eso tienes ese golpe en la sien. Sí, me lanzó una piedra, pero yo soy muy rápido. Basta de presumir tus historias. Mejor déjame contarte de la vez que fui a Acapulco y pude surfear una ola muy grande. No, 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 no. Eso es demasiado aburrido, Diego. Mejor cuéntame otra cosa. Fue un día muy bello. Now let's watch it again. And verify if you got them all correctly. Hola Diego. Hey Ebrahim, ¿cómo estás? Tengo algo que contarte. Um, ayer me salté la valla de mi vecino. ¿Qué? ¿Qué? ¿Por qué hiciste eso? Aposté con Carlos 100 pesos a que iba y me robaba una de sus vallas. Y vaya que no me iba a rehusar. Ahora entiendo, por eso tienes ese golpe en la sien. Sí, me lanzó una piedra, pero yo soy muy rápido. Basta de presumir tus historias. Mejor déjame contarte de la vez que fui a Acapulco y pude surfear una ola muy grande. No, 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 no. Eso es demasiado aburrido, Diego. Mejor cuéntame otra cosa. Fue un día muy bello. That's it for today, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. If so, please give it your thumbs up and share it with other learners. Also, leave your comments because we do read them and reply to them. Nos vemos en el siguiente video. Hasta luego. Hey, what's up, my friends from SpanishPod101.com. Once again, I'm Diego. And I'm Efraín. And today we're going to continue with our series of Mexican words that you should know. And in this video, we're going to show you 10 more words. So let's get started. Now, let's watch a sketch. So, we can see, and you can see if you understand every word that we are going to explain in this video. Let's go! Hey, Diego. Hey, Brain. ¿Por qué no nos echamos unas copitas? <laughs> no, ¿cómo crees? Acuérdate que ya casi es la parranda de José y tenemos que guardar toda la energía y además no tengo bastante dinero. Ahorita no me hagas panchos, solo serán unas copitas y en cuanto al dinero no te preocupes, haremos una vaquita para no gastar mucho. Mm, está bien, pero tráete la lira para cantar unas canciones y mientras yo preparo las copitas. De acuerdo. Hoy no quiero beber alcohol, mejor un té. ¡Listo! ¿Cuál quieres cantar? <risa> espera, espera. ¿Sabes? Me estaba acordando de la fiesta del año pasado ah. cuando el novio de Alondra se puso de mala copa y golpeó a Pedrito. Mm. <risa> y en respuesta a Pedrito lo aventó a la piscina. <risa> Cierto, ¿cómo olvidarlo? Se hizo un merequetengue. Vaya que sí. Aunque, ¿sabes? Todavía no entiendo por qué Alondra se hizo novia de un baquetón y de pilón agresivo como él sumado a que está bien mamey y además me dobla la estatura. <risa> bueno pues salud por eso. <risa> salud. <risa> Espera, ¿qué? Ok guys, as you might hear, one of the words that we use was merequetengue. So, what's a merequetengue? It literally means a mess or a problem. For example, Ebrahim Mañana cumplo una semana con mi novia y quiero regalarle lo mismo que tú le regalaste la vez pasada, entonces ¿me puedes ayudar? Oh, pero va a ser un merequetengue, hay que ir al centro a comprar los adornos, los globos, los dulces y no sabemos si el señor Ernesto todavía renta ese lugar. Con el inflable, sí, tienes toda la razón, mejor solamente chocolates. Mejor. Ok, 
The second word mm, that you heard is parranda, and it means a party. For example, oye, vamos a la parranda de este Juan. Se dicen que se va a poner buena. Claro, por supuesto, vamos. Okay, another word was pancho. So, what is a pancho? A pancho is basically a scene. So, for example, imagine that you are in a restaurant and you are waiting for the server to give you the menu and he doesn't even approach. So, you can start to make a scene. So, that's basically a pancho. For example, uh, el mesero no ha venido y yo ya tengo mucha hambre. Entonces, voy a hacer un pancho en el restaurante. Okay, another word that you heard is lira. And this word is used for, for referring a guitar. Guitarra. Lira. La lira. For example, yo toco muy bien la lira. Okay, guys. <laughs> Another word is vaquita, and uh, no, 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 that's not an animal. Basically, a vaquita is, for example, when you gather some money with your friends in order to buy something, either a product or even a service. So, for example, uh, Efraín, quiero ir a Acapulco, vamos. Pero Diego, yo no tengo dinero. No te preocupes, armamos la vaquita y nos vamos los dos. Vale. Woo! Okay, another word that you heard is baquetón. And it is used to refer someone that is lazy. Someone lazy, okay? So let's go to one example. Diego, ¿te cayó bien mi primo Rodrigo? No, la verdad no, él es muy baquetón. Bueno, ni siquiera estudia, tienes razón. Good. So, another one is pilón, and pilón is basically an extra, so you can translate it as on top of that, in Spanish, the pilón. So, for example, ayer tenía mucha hambre, mucha, mucha hambre, entonces comí media pizza, después unos tamales, después unas gorditas, mm. una quesadilla, y todavía tenía un poco de hambre, entonces, the pilón, también comí un poco de helado. Oh, Dios mío. Ok, the next word is um, mamey. And it is used to describe someone physically strong. For example, estoy bien mamey. Ok, guys, another word is mala copa. And mala copa refers to a person who's normally aggressive when he's drunk. So, for example, mi primo Rodrigo es muy mala copa. Toma dos cervezas y empieza a golpear a todo mundo. <laughs> Rayos. Okay, the last word is copitas. And it is a nice way and a familiar way to call a drink. An alcoholic drink, for example, Diego, vamos a echarnos unas copitas. No, Efraín, yo ya no tomo. Pero ayer tomaste. Desde hoy ya no tomo. Ok, guys, now let's watch once again the sketch, but now this time with subtitles so you can understand it better. So let's watch it. Hey Diego, hey Brain, ¿por qué no nos echamos unas copitas? <ríe> no, ¿cómo crees? Acuérdate que ya casi es la parranda de José y tenemos que guardar toda la energía y además no tengo bastante dinero. Ahorita no me hagas panchos, solo serán unas copitas y en cuanto al dinero no te preocupes, haremos una vaquita para no gastar mucho. Mm, está bien, pero... Tráete la lira para cantar unas canciones y mientras yo preparo las copitas. De acuerdo. Oh, 
Hoy no quiero beber alcohol. Mejor un té. ¡Listo! ¿Cuál quieres cantar? <risa> espera, espera. ¿Sabes? Me estaba acordando de la fiesta del año pasado ah. cuando el novio de Alondra se puso de mala copa y golpeó a Pedrito. Mm. <risa> y en respuesta Pedrito lo aventó a la piscina. <risa> Cierto, ¿cómo olvidarlo? Se hizo un merequetengue. Vaya que sí. Eh, aunque, ¿sabes? Todavía no entiendo por qué Alondra se hizo novia de un baquetón y de pilón agresivo como él. Sumado a que está bien mamey y además me dobla la estatura. <risa> bueno, pues salud por eso. <risa> salud. <risa> Espera, ¿qué? That's it for today. Friends of Spanish Pod 101.com. We love your thumbs up, we love your comments, and we do reply to them. Please subscribe to this channel so you will continue watching us. And we we love to produce videos for this channel. Yeah. <laughs> Hasta luego. <laughs> hey there, friends from SpanishPod101.com. As you might already know, I'm Efraín. And of course, I'm Diego. Yeah. And since we already cover some words that come from Nahuatl and we use in in Spanish, now we're going to cover some words that come from English. So enjoy the video. Woo! Nowadays, increasingly, the Spanish language uses more words that come from other languages. In this case, we're going to talk about English words. And why do we use these words? Well, it is basically because the word itself conveys an idea that we don't have a similar way to express it in our own language. So it is easier for us to just take them from, from this language and adapt it. So uh, in this video, we're going to show you some of these words that you can hear a lot from Spanish speakers. Okay, so the first example we have is very simple. And it is okay. Lo que refleja es una afirmación. En español se puede traducir como un simple está bien. Otra palabra que usamos es play. Y eso lo podemos ver, por ejemplo, cuando estamos con un reproductor de DVD o uno de Blu-ray o quizás cuando queremos ver una película. Uh, por ejemplo, cuando estamos en Netflix, eh, yo puedo decir, oye, ponle play, ponle play a la película. Así es, sería común escuchar de, de un hispanohablante la frase, hey, ponle play a la peli. Ponle play o dale play. Otra palabra que utilizamos muy frecuentemente es mail. Sin embargo, tenemos una traducción que es correo electrónico, pero en ocasiones únicamente decimos mail. Um, por ejemplo, solemos decir mándale un mail o te mandé un mail o voy a escribir un mail. <risa> ok, la siguiente palabra es crush. Y es muy común oírla entre chicas y chicos jóvenes y se usa para expresar un amor platónico, un amor imposible. Es como decir, ¿la ves? Ese es mi crush, está guapísima, hermosa, <risa> preciosa, <risa> preciosa. <risa> uh, ok, la siguiente palabra es eh, full. Podemos utilizar esta en dos sentidos. Número uno, para expresar la saciedad. Es decir, que ya no queremos comer más. Por ejemplo, cuando comemos un pozole, un plato de pozole, podemos decir, oh, estoy full, ya no puedo comer más. Pero también utilizamos full en la expresión a full para expresar con todo. Por ejemplo, Efraín, ya tenemos que terminar de grabar estos videos, tenemos que darle a full, con a full. todo, con toda la energía. Yeah. Eso es a full. La, la siguiente palabra es break. Al menos de nuestra generación es raro que un joven no haya usado esa palabra. Y se usa igual para expresar 
un tiempo de descanso, un momento para relajarse, un momento para dejar el trabajo y darse un tiempo. Es como decir, hermano, necesito un break, ya no puedo, ya no puedo grabar más, mi, mi cerebro está bloqueado. También el mío, tenemos que darnos un break. La siguiente palabra es gym y aunque tenemos la palabra en español que es gimnasio, es increíble ver cómo siempre cuando vamos al gimnasio nos referimos a voy al gym, incluso estos gimnasios se promocionan como gym, gym magno, gym strong, gym fitness, gym, muchos nombres, ninguno utiliza gimnasio. Ok, la siguiente expresión o conjunto de palabras es happy hour y esta es para los amantes de la bebida, donde usualmente en los bares la vemos ofrecida como al 2 por 1 dentro de la hora de 7 a 8 happy hour y no podemos decir más acerca de eso porque este es su canal clasificación A para todos y hasta ahí mi explicación. Aquí, hasta aquí mi reporte Joaquín. <ríe> ok, la siguiente expresión es, eh, bueno, o, o palabra más bien es DJ y aunque nosotros tenemos la palabra en español que es pinchadiscos, nadie, <ríe> nadie utiliza pinchadiscos. La palabra, no. Siempre decimos en México DJ, por ejemplo, mi DJ favorito es uh, Avicii. ¡Órale! Pero ya se murió. La siguiente palabra es vintage y esto es una moda que no quiere pasar la página, es común oírlo para describir un lugar, para describir una decoración, para describir ropa, música. Eh, hasta en literatura, en muchas partes vemos esa palabra vintage, como por ejemplo, esa decoración está bien vintage, está bien padre, no manches, tu playera está bien vintage, no está vintage, pero o sea, es un ejemplo. Exactamente. <risa> La siguiente palabra o expresión es light y esta en México es referente a un estilo de vida o a algo que es liviano, hablando de su, de sus características nutrimentales, por ejemplo, estoy llevando una vida donde salgo a correr, eh, donde como verduras y tomo agua, agua mineral, ando bien light Diego. Muy bien. Oye no manches también, también sabes qué, como así carnita de pollo bien rica, bien light la onda. Super light, uh -huh. excelente. La siguiente palabra es look y eso tiene que ver con tu forma de vestir, entonces podemos decir una expresión muy común es oye tienes un look increíble o eh qué buen look. Gracias. <risa> Bien la siguiente palabra es loser y en México se usa de igual forma y su significado es literal perdedor. Por ejemplo, cuando yo era chico y decía algo tonto o hacía algo tonto, los niños a mí me solían decir, ay eres un loser, no manches, esos niños eran unos, o sea, eran, eran unos, ¿qué tiene de malo decir? Ok, ok, dejen de censurarme, solamente trato de, ¿qué rayos? No manches, ¿por qué me tratan de? Ok, ok, la siguiente palabra es top y con top nos referimos a un grado inalcanzable, eh, entonces es muy común decir dime tu top 3 de canciones o tu top 3 de artistas musicales, uh, siempre nos referimos a o el top 10 de lugares que visitar en México, eh, deberíamos hacer un video así, ok, quizás para la siguiente. Hey, so we hope that you have enjoyed this video. Um, please give us your thumbs up and write below your comments. We 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 really read the comments. Please feel free to post them. <laughs> okay. So see you in the next 
Vidrio. Bye. Diego y Efra a la muerte querían retratar. En uno de sus videos sobre ella querían hablar. Pero cuando ella vino, dijo: A ustedes me los voy a llevar. Oh, that's scary. Yeah, man. Hello, my friend from SpanishBall101.com. My name is Diego. And I'm Efraín. And today we have a very special episode of a very famous tradition in Mexico. Yeah, Welcome right. to. Día, Día de Muertos. Muertos. So, enjoy this video. Woo! At the beginning, you heard a calaverita, and it is like a poem. It is written and published around the day of Dia de Muertos. That's correct. So, and Dia de Muertos is one of the most famous Mexican traditions that takes place on November the 1st and November the 2nd. And it became really popular due to two recent films. Number one, Coco, and number two, Spectre from James Bond. On top of that, the UN recognized Día de Muertos as World Heritage. Los historiadores creen que el Día de Muertos tiene un origen prehispánico, ya que los aztecas enterraban a sus muertos con ofrendas, con comida e incluso sus perros. Pensaban que ellos to tomaban un viaje de cuatro años en el Mictlán, donde eran procesados y escogidos por los dioses para ir a Tlaloca, algo así como un cielo azteca. Así es, con la llegada de los españoles, esta tradición prehispánica se juntó con la tradición católica de celebrar el Día de Todos los Santos. Es por eso que el Día de Muertos se celebra exactamente en las mismas fechas que el Día de Todos los Santos. Algo muy bonito de esta tradición es que esos dos días son los únicos días en los que los familiares muertos pueden visitar a sus familias aquí en el terreno de los vivos y es de ahí la gran importancia de las ofrendas. <risa> ok, ahora veamos. La ofrenda de Día de Muertos es un altar doméstico que usualmente tiene veladoras que iluminan el camino, flor de cepasúchil que de alguna forma indica el camino al muerto pero también se le pone comida, también se le pone eh, a objetos de uso cotidiano, como sus lentes, como un sombrero, una guitarra, y también aquellas cosas que le gustaban al difunto, ya sea eh, cigarros, cerveza y otras cosas. Exactamente. Ok, entonces ahora vamos a ver vocabulario que es esencial que tú conozcas porque está relacionado al Día de Muertos. Y la primera palabra, por supuesto, es el altar o la ofrenda de muertos, que es justamente lo que acaba de explicar Efraín. Así es. La segunda palabra podría ser alfeñique, la cual es una pasta de azúcar con la cual se hace la calaverita. Bueno, la calavera de dulce. <risa> Exactamente. Otra palabra es ataúd, que es una caja generalmente de madera donde se pone un cadáver para enterrarlo. La siguiente palabra es atole. Ay, Diego, cómo se me antoja un atole ahora mismo, el cual es una bebida de harina, de agua y fruta. Hmm. Deberíamos ir por un atole terminando este video. Oh, por favor. Perfecto. La siguiente palabra es... La calavera, que es la parte del esqueleto que forma la cabeza. Muy bien, bueno, también tenemos las muy famosas calaveras de azúcar, que como bien lo dicen, es un dulce hecho a base de azúcar y que tiene la forma de calaveras. Por ahora tendremos las calaveritas literarias, que, es, que son los primeros versos que yo me eché al principio del video, Diego. Ah, sí, muy buenos, por cierto. Perfecto, después tenemos las máscaras o también llamado las caretas, que son máscaras que se usan para ahuyentar a los espíritus al final de la celebración. La catrina, que es un esqueleto de la figura femenina creada por José Guadalupe Posada y sale en casi todo el arte mexicano. Además podemos ver a muchísimas personas disfrazadas de catrinas o en su versión masculina de catrines en Día de Muertos. A ver si nos encontramos unas, Diego. Esperemos que sí. 
La siguiente es la flor de cempasúchil, que es una flor de caléndula amarilla. Es también conocida como la flor de los muertos. También tenemos una parte importante que es donde se concentran los difuntos, que es el cementerio. Por supuesto en inglés, de cemetery. La siguiente es el pan de muerto. Y es un tipo de dulce especial que se prepara al horno. ¡Mmm, delicioso, Diego! Es un pan exquisito y bueno, por supuesto, eso se puede encontrar en noviembre y también un mes antes y de verdad que cuando lo venden ah, se vende demasiado demasiado de ese pan exquisito exquisito si vienes a México lo tienes que probar totalmente totalmente ok y la última palabra que tenemos es una tradición en día de muertos que es el papel picado que es básicamente papel de forma de colores y que es demasiado delgado que se coloca alrededor de las ofrendas That's it for today. Thank you for watching us, Friends of Spanish Pod 101.com. And if you were wondering, we are right here in Coyoacán, in the city of Mexico. Look at this, it is beautiful. And it is actually a very crowded place, especially during this celebration of Dia de Muertos. It's one of the most popular here in Mexico City. Hasta luego! Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.